Okay, thank you. All right, welcome everybody to our first virtual uh, regional leaders in open education meeting where we had all of our work groups and um, also very pleased to have um, other regional leadership efforts um, with us today too so that we can really talk about what we're all doing how we can work together um, and um, make sure we're not duplicating efforts um, this is una daly um, from ccoer at the open education global and let's see um, before i go into the details of this um, we wanted to take a moment here to um, reflect on what Arlo can do to recognize um, marginalized colleagues and students. And, and Quill wants to say a few words. Quill is one of our team leaders, um, as I think uh, many of you know. Um, I don't know that wants to say a few words is um, the right <laughs> thing to say here. I, I think it's that we need to say a few words. Um, and, and I think right now is a challenging time for us to talk about this um, my college has been doing a lot of work around equity for years but in recent days has been really focused on this conversation about um the whiteness of higher education and it made me reflect on the work we've done this year with arlo um, and trying to figure out, I think one of the things that, one of the reasons why we have Arlo, why we started to do this work is because we wanted to do a lot of work around what it means to be a part of our profession um, and how regional leadership leads to the definition of our profession. And as we go through that, I'd really like us to be asking questions today and as we move forward in our work around how we bring marginalized communities into these conversations and how we can use openness as a way to address some of the inequities that exist in higher ed and in our social makeup. So I don't know that I wanted to have to say that, but I feel like we have to say it and we have to address it and we have to continually address that conversation in every meeting we have in open education or we are not creating an inclusive movement and an inclusive profession. Thank you, Quill. And um, as you know, Quill was, you know, our president for many years of our um, CCCOER Executive Council. And uh, she started our e equity, diversity and inclusion blog, which we have continued over the last two and a half years. And um, it has been an opportunity to discuss these but issues, but without maybe the heightened urgency that we really need to bring to it. So thank you for that. And we have a survey uh, that you can take at the end of today or tomorrow, whenever you have time. And um, we, we're gonna ask you this <coughs> question too, if you, if you would like to share with us. <coughs> Any other comments from folks? All right, I, I wanna go into the agenda here uh, with people, but first of all, I wanna say welcome. We have um, 43 people online today. So really exciting. I, I would like to invite you to um, introduce yourself in the chat window. Um, I'm sorry we don't have time to let everyone introduce themselves. Um, individually um would love to do that um but um it, we'd be here uh, past <laughs> past 6 p.m eastern if we did that so yeah please introduce yourself in the um in the chat window um particularly those of you who are joining us for the first time um and i know we do have a number of people um who are joining us for the first time so from an overview perspective um we're um we're going to go into a panel here in a few moments. Um, first of all, we're going to have a few words uh, about Arlo, uh, where it came from, uh, with James Glaffer Grossclag, and then we're we're going to go into a panel with um, uh, with uh, uh, several other groups that um, we work with, but that are that have their own kind of separate groups, and and that is um, the higher ed compacts, the doers, and also the statewide leaders that is run out of the 
Florida virtual campus that Rebel runs. Um, and so we're really looking forward to that panel. They're gonna talk a little bit about um, their work. And then we're gonna go into, we're gonna ask them a couple of hard questions. And then we're gonna invite you to ask them questions. And um, that we, we expect will take about 45 minutes and then we will um, move into our work group presentations. And this is really the focus of the day is the work group presentations. Um, I have to say the panel's kind of the frosting on the cake. So thank you so much to our panelists who are joining us. Um, and we want your feedback on what the work that's being done um, that's in process and in some cases further along than others. Um, so that's really what we, we want today and um, appreciate you uh, verbalizing that. You can either use the chat or your microphone. We ask that you keep your microphone off if you're not speaking just due to the fact that we do have over 40 people on board. And then, um, so those are run about a half hour each Roughly, we might finish early on the, those, um, but we have a 15 minute break in between the two, four work groups that are presenting. And then we'll get to next steps. We're targeting about 2.15 Pacific to get to the next step section. And um, there'll be, the first thing we'll talk about with the next steps is crosswalking between all of these great regional um, open education efforts. And then we will shift to um, a, a community discussion around um, how we work with these materials and um, also potentially about um, issues around getting, um, getting people who are from more marginalized communities or sorry, um, more marginalized, I guess I would say ethnic groups involved, is making sure that we have the voices here that are important to have here in a regional open education leadership event. So any questions about that? And thank you, Liz has posted um, the agenda in more detail. We hope to stick to that. Um, <laughs> so that, that, that is our hope. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone, for introducing yourself. Really appreciate that. All right. I want to just, for a very brief moment here, talk about um, what we've where Arlo came from, and then um, invite James Glapagroskleck, who is also one of our other leaders, to talk. Um, so the Regional Leaders of Open Education really came out of this CCCOER member need to collaborate across institutional and state boundaries. Um, many, many of you are facing similar issues, and you really want to work on these and collaborate on these issues together to find common solutions and not duplicate efforts. And so we started this back last summer, um, and I will say our, our team has been Amy Hofer um, from Open Oregon, uh, Quill West uh, from um, Pierce College, the open education manager there, um, James Glapa Grosskleg from College of the Canyons and also a statewide California leader, um, as Amy and Quill are in their states, and, um, and then Denise Cote um, from College of DuPage, who's, she's the librarian there and also a statewide leader in Illinois. Um, and so they are leading their own in individual efforts. We met at, um, we met at open, Open Education 19, Open Ed 19, sorry, in Phoenix. And we had a whole day event there um, where the four groups um, were able to develop their initial plans. And they've been working on, on that uh, steadily since. And so really excited um, to have them share with you later on. But first of all, James is gonna give us a little bit of background on, on where this came from and kind of the vision for um, the future. Wow, thanks, Una. I really appreciate that. I appreciate being here. It's uh, exciting to kind of see everybody. Um, I'm not going to give a, a whole history of, of, uh, of the movement or uh, of how this all came to be, but I, I, did, I appreciate the opportunity to say a couple of words and, and dial us back to what, in my mind, I think of as the spirit of Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix, uh, last year, open ed, uh, where uh, this group uh, came together uh, for a full day before the o official open ed conference. Uh, for me, it was one of the one of the most fun days I'd ever had. I don't know if that, whether that's pathetic and sad a comment on my social life or uh, more of a uh, inspirational comment about how important open education is to me and, and to all of you here. Uh, but I think it was fantastic to spend the day uh, with uh, 
established and emerging leaders, uh, formal and informal leaders from all over the country, and we had friends from Canada as well. Uh, it was just terrific for me to see us taking our destiny in our hands, really, to, at, at the danger of overstating things. You know, in my mind, open education is evolving rapidly from a movement, a collection of individuals, a whole bunch of different organizations uh, where open is sort of an add-on. Maybe it's here, maybe it's there in, in, in an organization, but uh, it's just kind of this add-on and, and people are doing it because they, they feel the passion, they roll up their sleeves and take on something extra. It's, it's evolving into, in my mind again, a field, a profession. There are some people here who are lucky enough to uh, build their careers around open education. And I think most of us who don't get to do that uh, look really, really enviously at those who are able to place open education at the center of their careers. Um, so uh, for me, the, this, this project, Arlo, really represents the opportunity and the, the, the need for us to uh, control our destiny. Uh, to grasp what we're doing, uh, to shape what we want to do, uh, and to define what it is that we're doing and define the outcomes that we want to have. Um, there's also, if we talk about uh, Phoenix, there's no denying the uh, transition that happened with the Open Ed Conference last year, right? The day after we had our fantastic meeting, David Wiley drops the mic at the, uh, at the opening session. Uh, so there's a massive transition there. And, and, and maybe when real historians look back years from now, uh, they will see uh, that as a real change in uh, open education from a, a movement to a, 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 a professional field. And I think we have the opportunity and we have the responsibility to be at the center of that and to guide things. So the work groups here, the subtopics that we're gonna dive into today uh, come out of a lot of conversation around what, what the field, uh, the movement, uh, thinks are the key uh, sort of uh, themes, topics that, that we need to define in graphs. So we've got sustainability, professionalism, stewardship, and, and policy. So, so that's where those topics come from. We think those, those are, are essential to taking control of our destiny uh, and moving the field into being a proper field. Um, uh, so that's, that's kind of the promise and, and the hope and the fun of what we're doing here. Uh, I, I want to take one, one last minute, though, to uh, reflect on Quill's uh, injunction at the beginning. I really appreciate Quill uh, taking the time to express those uh, sentiments and that challenge to us. Um, and if you haven't yet seen Amy's tweet from last night, it's terrific. Look at Open Oregon. Um, um, and I, I, in, in my reflection on the current state of things, I, I realize how often I personally have used the term equity uh, as a polite way to disguise what I feel in my heart uh, is the work that I want to do, and that is anti-racist work. Um, but uh, polite society that I've been in, and that I think, I suspect many of ourselves find ourselves in, uh, uh, has not been ready to use, use that term or accept that term. Um, so I'm going to make a conscious effort to substitute uh, or to be really more conscious about whenever I use that term equity to really ask myself if that's what I mean or do I mean uh, anti-racist work instead of equity work. So uh, again, I'm really happy that we're all here and I'm going to kick it back to Una for uh, the start of the day with a really dynamic panel. Really happy to be here. Thanks everybody opening remarks and um, I'm very pleased now to introduce our panelists who are all um, regional open education leaders. I hope that term uh, works okay for them as well and I'm just going to go ahead and introduce them here and then we'll hear from Rebel first but first up I'm just going to go right left to right here. Um, we are very pleased to have Deep Shanoi with us today um, from the Doers Project. Um, and uh, also Rebel Cummings Saul, who is the Director of Digital Services and OER at OER, sorry, at OER, excuse me, Rebel for murdering that, at the Florida Academic Library. 
at, at Florida Virtual Campus. And last but certainly not least, we have Tanya Spillavoy, who is at Wichi. Um, let me see, and I'm sorry, I'm moving this so I can act. She's the director of open policy there. And um, she also leads um, the work among the higher ed compacts as well around OER. So very excited to have uh, those speakers today to come and tell us about their really inspiring projects. And Rebel, I'm going to ask you to go first, if that's okay. Sounds great. So the question that I, um, we're not doing questions yet, we're just doing introductions. Sorry, did okay. I miss that part? Or am I going straight to the question? Uh, no, no, please. Um, I, I want you each to have, you know, five minutes to talk about what you're doing in your individual groups. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, my, uh, I don't know if we are an official, I guess we're an official group now. Everybody keeps calling us an official group, so I'm gonna take it. Um, we're an official group of OER statewide leaders. Um, we came together kind of nonchalantly and out of frustration. Um, Amy here on the call today can um, witness to that frustration that we felt. Um, as statewide leaders, looking to the future and also to the past about um, the work that we had been doing um, in kind of siloed um, areas and how we might be able to work um, more collaboratively in the future and so that was kind of the idea of pulling um, this group together and I started with a simple call out um, for people to either self-identify or nominate someone from their state um, and that list has started um, and has consistently grown month after month. Um, so we are just asking anybody who feels that they are a leader for their state or participates in a statewide um, leadership aspect in their state or wants to has aspirations for that even um, are, invi are invited to join this group it's an open group anybody is welcome to join um, we have discussion point agenda area areas that we look at um, each week and really the goal um, the goal for the whole year we accomplished in the first meeting um, so this group has been doing um, really great work so far trying to pull together resources and align um, strategies and our thinking so that we can <laughs> all have um, the best resources and, um, and move forward um, on the whole, um, sorry, I'm trying to read the chat too as it goes by. So, and move forward on, um, you know, what it is that we're trying to do as a nation. Um, I know that we're all individually trying to do these things um, within our states, but this is one that we are able to, you know, to get together and, and I think we're making great progress um, in even just the short time. And I know we're short on time, so I'm gonna stop and wait for. Um, thank you, Rebel. Um, D um, d did you want to share with people, uh, if, if they want to get involved with your organization, would they contact you directly? Is that? Um... Um, yeah, they can just email me, rsols at flbc.org. I'll yeah. put that into the chat. Thank you. Yeah, and any questions for Rebel? Um, since she, she did finish up <laughs> two minutes early, I, so we'll, we'll leave that open for Q&A. Um, And I know, Rebel, that you explained to me that um, you'd been collecting state state documents around um, funding and data and, um, let me see, funding. <laughs> it's in the crosswalk. But <laughs> it's not ability, much. administration, yeah. Yeah, all that. Um, so we, um, as a group, kind of brought together what are our challenges that we're struggling with right now, and we identified a long list of that. And from that, we had people kind of vote up um, those challenges as to which ones they were dealing with on a state level in their state. And so three naturally came kind of to the top, and we've been working um, on those. And we have a shared um, documents area that we use right now. And it was actually brought up in our last conversation on whether or not we should have more structure to that sharing. Um, so that's something we'll be looking at in our next meeting, I think. Great, great, wonderful. Thank you so much, Rebel. 
All right, and next up, I'm going to ask Tanya Spillavoy to um, to go. And um, Tanya, I'll move the slides for you if that's okay. Uh, Tanya, can you? Um, I'm not hearing okay, you. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you great. All right, can Thank you? you. And we can see you. Can you all hear me? Can you see me now? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so I think that it's, hello everybody, it's great to have you all here. And I think it's probably important for me to show you a map um, and tell you what a regional compact is. Uh, the four regional compacts are the Midwestern Higher Education Compact, that's MEC, which is um, abbreviated M-H-E-C. The New England Board of Higher Education, and we call that NEBI. The Southern Regional Education Board, SREB. And the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education, and that's WICHI. And you'll see in the center of the map, there are two states that are members of two regional compacts. Um, North Dakota and South Dakota are jointly affiliated with WICHI and MEC. You'll also notice that um, the compacts have uh, lots of outreach among other affiliated territories, such as um, you can see Hawaii is part of WICHI, and so they also reach out beyond the continental U.S. And they have a shared common interest in assisting and promoting the adoption and scaling of open educational resources. Um, just for context, the regional compacts have been valued resources for decision makers and institutional leaders, researchers and practitioners. Um, states have made significant investments in their compacts since they were established. Um, the, the commissioners who serve on regional compact boards are appointed by governors of their states. And the states um, usually have some sort of language in their constitution or within law that allows them to join into a regional compact collaboration. And they do so for a variety of purposes. Um, and for historical purposes, just to tell you how long they've been around, um, SREB, the Southern Regional Board that is, has the most member states, and Wanda's on the call, um, Wanda Barker from SREB, and she has much more historical knowledge about SREB than I do. But they were established in 1948. Um, WICHI was established in 1953, NEBI in 1955, and MEC in 1991. Um, and so states who send their commissioners, such as SHEO heads, like state higher education executive officers, um, sometimes presidents of systems, sometimes um, a lot of legislators are sit on the boards, they really gather together to have a nonpartisan partner in effective policy practice and research. And they've done a lot of things together in the past to adopt and sustain efforts on behalf of students. Some of the things that they've done are um, collaborations around exchange for students. So let's say a state like North Dakota doesn't have um, a veterinarian school. They have an agreement with other states where we could send a certain number of students to another state and attend the veterinary school, um, and they hold those seats. Um, there's also interstate agreements for the purposes of state authorization reciprocity for distance education and all kinds of other interstate agreements. This is really a place where a lot of policy gets, gets passed among the state's best practice. And so um, when compact leaders come together, they share all the awesome things that are happening in the states and they take it back and they duplicate those efforts and a lot of goodness goes really quickly at the concept um, at the compact level. Um, and so it's an exciting moment in history that all four regional compacts have come together to talk about open educational resources. Um, in the history of all time, the regional compacts have only come together around one other issue, and that was distance education um, authorization. And so to talk about the importance of this moment when all four regional compacts are talking about sustainability of open educational resources, reducing costs for students, promoting equity, and as Jane said, anti-racism, uh, making uh, the materials more open, more available, 
more equitable for all students. That is a huge moment for um, everybody, really, and it's a it's an exciting thing. So, to give you some ex example of how they go about working, and you can go to the next slide. The regional compact. This is an example of the MEC multi-state open educational resources convening. Um, really, the regional compacts are very mindful that there's a lot of activity going on in states and a lot of grassroots efforts. Um, and they want to support that and not um, supplant that. And you can see an example that we, um, we brought together stakeholders in the MEC region. Um, members from each of the 12 MEC states were in attendance. And these folks were people who were part of libraries, policymakers, SHEO heads, K-12 folks, um, distance education, and a lot of them had never spoken with each other before, even in their state, let alone as a multi-state. We brought them in the same room together and said, hey, did you know that there's actually a librarian in your state that is doing these wonderful things with OPEN? And they have a whole repository, and they even have an open library in the state of Minnesota, and you can all use that, right? So just getting people in the same room together was highly productive because um, a lot of the people hadn't even, they didn't know even what was happening in their own states around open, let alone what was happening in multi-states in their regions. Um, we also brought in um, uh, national leaders in open, like Nicole Allen did a keynote, and others who were there to just kind of introduce them to open education as a concept and introduce to the amazing movement that's happening all over the world. Uh, so my job is to coordinate all four regional compacts. We hold weekly meetings. Um, there's wonderful teammates um, who are, some of them are on this call right now, who uh, are really passionate about bringing open to their uh, regional compact um, and empowering the, the folks who are already doing the work and then introducing open to people who need to hear about it, who could make a huge difference in these states. Uh, so I just wanted to um, put that out there. And if, if you all have questions, that's kind of the high level um, overview of what a compact is and what we're doing and how we would love to support the open educational resources movement that's already happening, but just on a more formalized, coordinated effort um, at this very high state level. Thanks so much, Tanya, for that overview. And I do think we have representatives from each of the um, compacts here today. Do you want to introduce the, the other three um, compacts? Sure. And they can probably wave. <laughs> we have, um, and these are people I've worked with in the past who have done amazing things within their compact states. I think a lot of the things that happen um, in higher ed happens kind of, the rest of us think, oh, wow, something wonderful happened. And they don't realize that it really took a lot of effort and a lot of emphasis and some great policymaking and work from the regional compact. So um, some of the people who I could credit with the awesome things that are happening for students is, um, well, we have, uh, let's see if I can find them on here, but Wanda Barker from SREB, um, Liliana Diaz, represented Witchy and Jenny Parks is here from MEC. And we also probably might have um, Rachel Stachowiak here from um, the Nebi region. So um, they also have a, a really great OER fellow in the Nebi region. If she's on, I can't tell, but um, her name is, is Lindsay Gum. Yeah, well, you know, um, Lindsay uh, was hoping to join us today. I don't know if she made it, I hope she did. Um, and we need to get Rachel on our list too. So, um, uh, Paul had a quick question for you. Um, Paul, if you don't mind, I think we will um, wait to um, answer that one because I want to give Deep a chance to, um, to do his presentation and then we'll come back to Paul's question. And maybe um, you can take a look at that in the meanwhile, Tanya, in the chat window. Sure. It's a good question. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And, um, Deep, I would like to turn it over to you now. Thanks, hey everybody. Um, uh, thanks for having me and also wanted to let you know there are other doers folks on this call. Um, 
Amy Hofer, Andy McKinney, uh, Brittany Dudek. Um, I hope I didn't miss anybody. I was trying to look through who all's joined so far, um, but I'll certainly provide information um, and, and guys jump in if, if I miss anything uh, that you'd like to say, please go ahead. Uh, Doers is, um, I think, uh, compared to uh, the compacts relatively new, it was kicked off as a conversation between uh, State University of New York, City University of New York and Maryland um, in 2017. Um, and it's really focused on OER um, uh, issues at the system level. So um, it's grown, as you could see from that map on the screen, um, to about, um, I think, 23 members now. I think that's about right. Um, and it tends to either be a system. So like in, you could see like in Texas, two systems join University of Texas and A&M at the system level, um, or it could actually be statewide representation. Um, uh, you know, there are organizations like Amy um, uh, with um, Open Oregon um, uh, educational resources or um, affordable learning Georgia where it's it's a group that is dealing with the OER issue statewide in a few cases it could be um, there's I think one board of regents and a couple departments of higher ed so um, it's really open to any um, of entities at that level um, uh, of organization so you know multi-campus or statewide um, and I guess really the uh, and it's US and Canada. We have um, two participants from Canada as well. Um, and really the approach of this group is around projects. So we've got projects which I'll go over in a minute. Um, and we've also recently stood up a website which you could see at the bottom of the screen there. So I will go through stuff quickly, but if you would like to uh, get a little bit more information or anything is too fast, you can certainly flip over there. Um, but, um, you know, uh, whether, you know, I guess really this organization, what has drawn people to it is people are interested in the organizations that are interested in the specific project, so they could see some value in it as well. So I think over time, you know, membership may um, uh, fluctuate as people get interested. This is the group that's interested in our current set of projects, which we are aiming to get mostly done by this October. And then I think we'll see, you know, that's really the, it'll be the first set of projects this group has really tried to do together. Um, and then we'll see um, from there where we go um, after that. Um, Una, could you take the next page, please? Absolutely. Thank you. So Doers is organized into three work groups around uh, different topics. There's one on research, one on equity, um, one on uh, capacity building. So, and those groups have, um, uh, you know, very specific uh, projects that are on their plate. Um, the research group is doing a landscape analysis. I would actually say these have shifted a little bit since we wrote them. Um, it's more of a synthesis of the, um, uh, the materials uh, available in OER. Um, and it sort of stems from the fact that like a lot of our members are people who might be like a the vice chancellor who is responsible for the OER issue in their system. And they're getting drawn into conversations with other stakeholders, like maybe the chancellor's office or the provost's office for the system. And people are confused. They're like confusing OER and inclusive access, for example. So just trying to write some sort of explainer for those folks to really help them. Um, the um, uh, research agenda or research priorities has shifted a little bit. And, and in the crosswalk section we talk about later, um, uh, we'll, we can talk about it some more because I think there is, is good collaboration opportunity with other projects. Um, we'd initially started out thinking that um, we were going to look at research standards for OER. Um, and I think what we realized a more valuable contribution based on the skills in, in, the, in the work group of the people involved with it would be to um, uh, be a bit narrower than that. So we were a little bit, um, uh, it was a little daunting to come up with all those. So we've kind of scoped it down for ourselves where we really wanna focus on a research question or questions for which we will put together some data standards um, but then also see if, and again, this is not confirmed, but we're trying to see if we can find um, a, a data archive partner. So if researchers want to 
use this methodology and then contribute data, it's in a place where everybody can get at each other's data. So that way, across different state systems, we're actually sharing data um, and it's not, you know, penned up in one place or another. Um, with equity, it's either the guidebook or blueprint. We're still settling on the name for that one. Um, that was a project that started long before uh, recent events. Um, and it's, um, I appreciate James's comment before uh, about different ways in which we use equity. Um, equity here, equity and OER here was, I think, meant in a, in a, in a broad way, certainly inclusive of race, um, but uh, other kinds of inequities, uh, uh, sources of inequity as well. Um, and with that particular project, what we're developing is a guidebook which will um, uh, take a stab at a definition um, and also produce a rubric that goes with it. So if a system is trying to say, how are we doing with equity issues in OER, there is some way to kind of see how you're doing to give you, not in any judgmental way, but to give advice about, you know, uh, how could you do better, what areas you could do better. Um, and um, some case studies and, and some practices that would go with that. Uh, in capacity building, uh, we're working on listing and fulfillment in bookstores. Um, some of you folks may have seen that um, survey come out through Twitter earlier in the year. Um, the idea there really is to deal with practical issues that are happening for students when they go to the bookstore and you know, there's actually digital OER available, but the print copy is marked as required and, and all these sort of confusing problems. Uh, and there we're really looking at it. We found as we dug into it, it's not just bookstores, there's some upstream pieces as well, like campus policy. So we're trying to sort of paint a, a continuum there of, of best practices about when you finally get to the end point where our students access OER, be it digitally or in print, that experience goes better. Um, and then the final project is on tenure and promotion. That one uh, is evolving. I think we did start it out as a, the thought was to try to write model policy. And I think what we found is that there are so many diverse tenure approaches to tenure and promotion that um, it's a challenge to do that. So uh, we are taking more of a, um, a conceptual approach to that project where we're gonna talk about ways in which different stakeholders. So how can faculty talk about OER? Um, what can you do at the policy level at your institution and things like that? So we're going to just take a little bit more holistic approach um, than just talking about the policy. So Great. those are the five projects. Yeah, let me pause there. All right. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Deep, for sharing those. Uh, lots of really good um, and concrete kind of deliverables that uh, the doers have um, come up with. Um, and Exciting to see your new website. I haven't seen it yet, but I will. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, just up. Any feedback, let us know, folks. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and um, actually, to get to, um, just to respond to Paul's comment real quickly, we do have a statement up there about how OER and COVID fit together. So if that's of use to anybody when you're having those discussions, you know, please feel free to, it's openly licensed, please feel free to borrow from it if, if it's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, I also want to give um, I also want to give um, um, Tanya a chance to respond to the question about the <clears throat> the pandemic as well um, and how that might have affected our educational compacts and has you know the shift to online also um, supported um, movement to OER. I'm paraphrasing here. There it is. So um, for sure, the pandemic has affected how we've thought about um, working with states and stakeholders around open education. Um, the, the actual term um, open education in, in the broad sense where we might say like free and open college, that would be even a step beyond. Um, so far, the compacts are really focused on open educational resources, but within, you know, just specific areas like what about the overlap for dual credit and K-12, um, really creating this pathway between K-12 and, and institutions uh, at the collegiate level. And um, there's, there's this wonderful thing that MET can do where they um, leverage vendor contracts where they can um, help States come together around a compact, say, um, 
insurance or something like that. Well, we thought, well, why couldn't they do that for course markings, right? So there's all kinds of opportunities um, that the Compact can do to help the OER community move forward. I, I wouldn't exactly say that they've ventured quite into open education, which I think of more as like, um, you know, the open university where anybody can go for free, although that would be awesome. <laughs> but they're not, they're not doing that. We're working on OER specifically. Great. Th thank you for that, Tanya. Um, so, <laughs> so I've asked Amy to go ahead and share the Arlo virtual crosswalk in the chat window. Um, at this point, Amy, I'm sorry, I don't feel like um, we can go into that conversation more deeply, but I want to invite people to edit or add comments in there. I know a few people can't stay till the end, and I, I apologize for that. Um, we will shift to the crosswalk right after the project presentations. Thank you, Amy, for sharing that. Um, we had a few questions that we uh, wanted to ask our panelists. Um, and um, if there's other questions that come up, we could um, shift to that instead. I think we have about, um, we have about 15 minutes before we go into um, our, each of our groups, each of our groups presenting. So um, I don't know how people are feeling. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of questions. I'm seeing some great comments from Spencer Ellis at uh, the Colorado, um, Colorado State um, asking about K through 12 and higher ed collaborations are a hot topic right now. Would love to hear more if folks have concrete artifacts to share. Okay, so, and thank you. Uh, looks like uh, Rebel has some some um, resources to share with them as well. So I'm going to go ahead, while we don't have any specific questions in here, I'm going to go ahead with our first question, which is, why is growing the next generation of open education leaders important? And Rebel, I think we assigned this one to you. Yes, you did. Okay, so um, I guess the most important answer is because I'm one of them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, it's important because um, we're all in this together, I think, and um, growing the next generation helps um, not only this generation, um, I think kind of, um, I don't know, almost justify the work that we have done in a way. I think it's important for us to document the efforts that have been made to date so that um, people coming in um, who are just joining the conversation or those who are starting to maybe grow more in that area of leadership um, don't feel like they have to um, start from the bottom. And I think that is, where a lot of us in this room probably started. And so it's important to give the next generation a leg up and um, allow, um, allow them to, you know, kind of grow off the, our backs and off of the rung of the ladder that we've already created so that they can grow higher um, and reach a larger impact of audience. I think for us, it's important um, for those who are in the conversation it helps to support our daily work and our visionary goals of tomorrow as well. So um, I know in our group particularly, we talk a lot about um, critical news and developments. Um, so what is coming at us that we need to be aware of or what is coming for the future? And so that helps us um, to be able to shape what our guidance and our recommendations, our best practices, um, as well um, <clears throat> for us um, and I think for a lot of people um, it helps them to overcome the challenges that we may have already um, either overcome or partially um, combated I don't know if that makes sense but um, so they don't have to um, go over the speed hump that we have already gone over. We can tell them um, how to just go to the other side and continue. I think that's a, a big important for us and um, just growing and growing ourselves, um, helping to grow the next generation helps to grow ourselves. So as we um, 
relate our experiences to what the next generation is dealing with, um, it helps us to see potential um, errors in our ways and um, practices. I know um, several of us have learned from our first OER speech. Um, we would probably not deliver that same speech today. So I think um, I think that's important of helping our our arguments grow and our motivation factors for faculty. Um, so we just we make the process better um, for everyone. Thank you, Rebel, um, for that thoughtful response. And um, I know that there's, um, you know, there may have been times in the past where we were more exclusionary about encompassing um, all of our colleagues and would-be colleagues. And so um, I think there's a lot of room for all of us to grow. Um, and I know uh, Tanya has mentioned that uh, the SPARK Leadership Program um, is accepting uh, cohorts, uh, uh, sorry, applicants for their third cohort. I'm sorry, their fourth cohort, I'm guessing. Um, and we and we we're very lucky to have Nicole Allen, I think she's still on the call with us here, and Tanya Spillaboy, who leads specifically a leadership program for librarians. Yeah, wonderful. And yeah. Una, I'm so sorry to cut in. I just wanted to quickly note that we are actually expanding the program beyond just librarians for this year for anybody who's interested. Oh, okay, wonderful. Exciting to hear that. Okay. Um, that's really super. I, the, out, the outputs from that program have been just amazing, the ones that I've seen. So thanks for that. Um, so next, I think we're going to go to the challenges. Um, and I'm going to ask folks to probably stick to two or three minutes on their answers. Um, uh, um, so Deep, this was yours. What are the challenges of growing open education leadership? And I realize that's a very open-ended question. I was going to say, we could probably all <laughs> talk on everybody <laughs> on this call can just say them. So I'll try to be super brief. Um, just about two things that have stood out to me, particularly having worked kind of you know, um, uh, with the system level. Um, I think one thing is culture um, in the sense that, you know, people can be interested in OER, but is it considered a valuable part of your career? Um, you know, can we get a partially funded or fully funded line for a librarian who focuses on OER and it's actually part of that? Um, and so I think, you know, all the efforts like the, the spark one we're talking about in the window in the chat window. Um, the, uh, the Arlo group on, you know, building the profession. I think all those things will help with that. But I think certainly as you're trying to grow. We're trying to grow the number of leaders uh, we have certainly people ask what you know, there are questions like, hey, if I put time into this, you know, uh, how does that affect my career progression or, you know, uh, is it recognized? Is it of value? So I think that kind of whole culture change is one big challenge. And the other challenge, I think, and this is sort of thinking about as leaders in OER speak with other leaders is really in just building that understanding of what OER does. I think, and this is one of the reasons in doers and I think in some of the other efforts, people are really looking at research a lot is that I think it's kind of gotten out in the culture um, of leadership at a lot of institutions that OER saves money. Um, all the other benefits of it, I think, are not as well understood. Um, and part of that is because, you know, research is evolving. We're all, we're all still developing that. But I think that's the, the second challenge is just really what people outside the OER community think OER is. So as we change that message, I think we'll be able to draw in more leaders. Thank you, Deep. Um, and our final question um, is, and we're still waiting for questions from the audience as well, is um, what opportunities arise as we grow um, regional open education leaders? And um, we, <laughs> we gave this one to Tanya. So I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we're, we need to respond to currently, especially with the change with the COVID environment. Um, we're seeing that everybody all of a sudden had to transition to online and so many students were without um, access to education. And then in the same time, the, um, the publishers swept in and said, hey, here's access to my um, limited time offer of my, um, my catalog, right? So 
all of these things sort of happened at once and it left the open education community all sort of stunned. Like, what do we do now? Who's in charge? And within that, um, we didn't have a real plan, right? A concerted effort around being nimble. There's a lot of people doing a lot of things, duplication of effort, a lot of people um, creating similar um, initiatives or materials or guidebooks or handbooks and all kinds of things out there. And people have a hard time finding it. So they get on Twitter and look around or they start asking friends. So an opportunity that arises as we grow regional open education leaders is just to make us all more coordinated, all more aware of what other, others are doing. It'll, it'll make us better able to respond to crises such as COVID, to um, efforts made by publishers, and to really have a, like instead of a, uh, we need to be more proactive instead of reactive to these instances. Um, I really think that if we're sharing more coordinated, um, we're ahead of the game instead of sort of trying to keep up. And I really hope that um, as we grow more people within the region, that there'll be a lot more sharing, a lot more awareness of where to find things and how to work together. Thank you for that, Tanya. And um, Amy, you, you've brought up um, a question in the chat window. Would you like to speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, I mean, talking about, um, you know, bringing new leaders on and making open ed a welcoming profession. Um, it does. I mean, I was just noticing that mentorship is not on the crosswalk document. Um, but I will also just say that, you know, I say that with a little bit of hesitation I did. Um, at one point I, you know, informally tried to get a mentorship effort going just specifically in Oregon and it wasn't one of my successes. Um, it fizzled pretty quickly. So, um, you know, obviously <laughs> others have been more successful with that kind of effort. Um, and I can see that Tanya says that it's part of regional compact. So, so it, that would be great to have mentorship represented here on the kinds of things that statewide groups are doing. Um, but then I guess my follow-up question is um, the way that I got started was by relying on um, networks. You know, even in 2015, there were networks and there are people that are on this call right now that I cold called, like Quill and Una and Nicole, um, and who helped me get started. And so um, there are like informal ways of finding mentorship. So maybe a formal program isn't what's needed. Yeah, thank you for that, Amy. And, you know, James asked a question just before that, um, which I think the mentorship somewhat addresses. So James asked, what should we do that we're not doing to grow leaders? And I, I think um, whether it's an informal or a more structured mentoring program um, would, would be helpful. Um, and and I, can I add to that? Yes, please do, Rebel. I was going to ask other people. Um, how to do this. Yeah. So one of the things that we heard is that there's a lack of recognition of their efforts. So one of the things that you could do is recognize those and their efforts that they have done. And I know that we say, I say this a lot to um, my institutional leaders, you know, celebrate even if it's just one um, you know, one person, um, that person, we should shout it from the rooftops and let everybody know. So I think that's one thing that we're not doing well is supporting um, the highlight and recognition of the work that some of the regional leaders have done. Good, good point. Um, let's see, Paul, you had a question here. Uh... <laughs> Yes, so Paul, do you want to speak to that? Um, Paul has posed a question in the chat window or a comment. Sure, I'll just say, I mean, I, I think that it's always fascinating. I mean, I, I love these uh, uh, efforts to coordinate and collaborate across regions and, and nationally. And, and sometimes when I think about the aspirations for, um, you know, what, what open education might look like in its not ideal state, because 
the resources are ultimately shareable and reusable and remixable by anyone, then the way we constrain ourselves sometimes by thinking only regionally or nationally, it feels to me like a self-imposed limitation. And, um, and of course, you know, in our work at Open Education Global, we tend to think more globally. And so, so I just thought I'd put that out there, Una, as food for thought. I think there are opportunities to consider collaboration and, and, and you know, coordination beyond just regional and national boundaries. And it's inherent in the open education principles themselves that, that there really are no sort of, you know, boundaries that we tend to impose on some of our work. So that's all I'll say. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Paul. And um, there's been some great comments here. Um, Michael Mills, of course, uh, said he's, I know that at Montgomery College, they, they are um, exploring some international membership or uh, collaboration as well. I think it's on open education. And then, of course, there's the open education for a better world, which um, some of our leaders, uh, not only our low leaders, but also on the executive council have uh, acted as mentors um, in those programs. So, yes. Um, and that's a yeah. Thank you all for sharing those great comments. Um, we're just about finished. We have a minute or two before we transition to our first um, presentation. Um, any final thoughts or questions for? Thank you, Regina. You've. <laughs> um, okay, so here's Regina's question. And Regina, I might ask you to speak up. So my question, Regina says, is how do we fold in these statewide coalitions from non-system states? Obviously, Michigan OER Network hasn't signed up for membership yet. Okay. Uh, Regina, do you want to do you want to speak up? Um, just I'm having I, I'm reading the question, but <laughs> I'm not sure. I, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, the, yeah. So, um, so if we are, if we want to grow um, statewide OER leaders, um, I think we should fold in those states also that are not part of um, system states. Um, that is one of the things that, you know, we are talking about in um, the Michigan OER network. We have not launched it yet um, as broadly as um, we wanted because um, the Michigan OER summit was um, canceled this year due to COVID. Um, yeah, so I, I was just looking at the members and it seems like when I looked at it, most of the members are all from system states. Um, so how do we, how do we fold those um, states that are not um, set up that way? Great, great question. Yeah, great question, um, Regina. Um, and I, I don't know if, um, and, and when you say, how, how do we encourage them to participate in Yes, all how do we encourage them to participate? Because there's also a lot of things that are, grow, are you know, happening in those states that may not be, um, you know, part of, of a system-wide um, higher ed you know, system. And I think that is the challenge that um, we, we have for the Michigan OER network because we really want to fold in um, not just higher ed, but also K to 12. And, um, you know, we have a robust participation among our K to 12 colleagues also in Michigan. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And, and, uh, and each state, like what Tanya has mentioned, each state is um, organized differently in terms of um, how how higher education governance is um, run. Not only higher ed, but also K through 12. Yeah, but K through yeah. 12, yes. Yes. Across the spectrum so that's one of, the, of um, education. So that's one of the things that... Sorry. That's one of the things that the regional compacts are really experts in is bringing... Um, State stakeholders together and they do understand all the governance issues in their states 
and maybe Jenny can talk about how she organized, um, but that MEC OER state action team that came out of um, Michigan was directly related to the work that we did in with the MEC region. So there's amazing things that the regional compacts can do even in states that don't have um, like a, a system per se. Yeah, and that, and I think, and to, to what you just mentioned, Tanya, and as I mentioned in the chat, um, that is really a direct offshoot. The project that we have with uh, Michigan OER Network is the major project that was um, an offshoot from that MEC gathering. And, you know, regional compacts really play um, an important role towards this coalition. Yeah, so it's a yeah, it's a really great question. Um, it, but I do think it's the regional compacts who are who know their own states best and how. So I, I'm really glad that we have representatives from I think all four today um, to help us with those questions. So that that's kind of a parking lot issue for us, Regina. Thank you for bringing that one up. A anyone else want to share on that before we make the transition over? I just wanted to say that the, I shared the statewide leaders link in the chat, and that's a great way to find out um, others who are in your state if you don't know they've, if they've self-identified. Absolutely. Thanks, Rebel. Oh, thank you, Paul. <laughs> so Paul says that we, I'm sorry, uh, Paul said that there's in the chat window, there's been a uh, um, a question about um, an early leader, early career leader award, and we did add that this year. I thought we did, but I wasn't sure. So the so OE Global has um, a set of um, awards that um, are given every year, uh, and the nomination is open right now, and it includes students and um, uh, educational leaders and um, educators in the classroom or, or virtually and um, also includes a lot of projects in different categories. And it's exciting to see that we have a, um, an Emerging Leader Award. So, wonderful. All right, well, thank you to our panelists for sharing with us that inspiring work that they're doing. And um, I know there's, there's a lot of interest in how we can collaborate and um, we will be touching on that after our um, work groups present. And so these are our four work groups. Uh, James, of course, mentioned those, but, and this is our beautiful new graphic that uh, Liz and our um, graphic designer Mario um, have come up with. Um, so showing that sustainability, policy and strategy, stewardship and professionalism are um, the key areas that we're um, organizing our projects around. And these are the guiding questions. I think these have changed a few times, but overall, each of our projects is now going to present um, what they're doing, and then they're going to um, ask for um, suggestions about information to add to make this project, to make their project more representative. Um, how will this be useful to your program, or how can they make it more useful? And finally, feedback on the overall presentation to make the information easier to navigate. So kind of what would be the final format? Uh, where might this live so that it would support ongoing adaptation and improvement over time. And before we jump to this, um, I want to make sure that um, our, our, each group has their scribe identified. Is that, is that true? So Amy, I know you're up first and... Um, yeah, did, um, Liz pinged me to point out that we don't have a scribe and I'm wondering if somebody from our group wants to volunteer on the spot, and if not, I'll do my best to take some notes. Um, thanks, Liz. Liz, would you mind doing the scribe for Amy's, and I'll pick up for other groups if needed. Would that would that Actually, work? Actually, we we have a volunteer. Oh, you do. <laughs> thanks, Wade. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, who yeah. who volunteered? Uh, Wade. Oh, thank you, Wade. That's that's wonderful. And um, Wade, Liz has a folder uh, where there's a set of uh, Google Docs, um, and I think they're identified by the group. So if that's helpful, you could 
use that document. And she put that right in the chat window. All right. Um, Liz, did you want to stop the recording and restart it? Or what were you, what, what did you want to do there? I already did, but I could again if you want. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Amy. Sorry, uh, we haven't done this before and we're having a lot of fun with it. So Amy, please uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, so um, I'll just preface um, this by, um, I guess I'll introduce myself here. I'm Amy Hoffer. I'm uh, the statewide coordinator for Oregon's higher ed. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, you can see who's been in the sustainability work group. And thank you so much to everyone that's been participating. Um, and um, just really brief background. Um, the slides that I'm going to share were also presented during Open Ed Week. And um, when we did a joint um, panel webinar to talk about the Arlo projects that have been ongoing. Um, and then our last slide was like, you know, call for community feedback and additional documents. And um, then immediately after that, we started, um, you know, heading into a crisis with a global pandemic and everybody scrambling to get their spring term offered remotely. So um, I don't think that it was um, anything to do with the quality of the sustainability work group work, but we didn't get any feedback as a result of our Open Ed Week project. So um, we're really hoping to hear from folks today about what you think. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so the sustainability group was really um, inspired by Nicole Allen's remarks at the beginning of our pre-conference um, day in Phoenix. Um, and she talked about um, a metaphor of infrastructure, like you know, physical roads and bridges, um, and how we want to see open education as core to what we do in higher ed. Um, so, what that might look like, some transitions that we would want to see would be, you know, things like moving from having one-time funding to having continuous funding, or um, things happening on one campus in a state to um, open ed being at the system, state, or regional level. Um, basically, you know, these different situations where you can think about OER as being something extra that's like added to people's already very full plates, and instead thinking OER is already part of what we do. Um, and so in order to address that gap and get ourselves from point A to point B, we started thinking about like, well, what do we need? We need expertise on campus. We need whole teams, not just individual champions. We need faculty and administrative support. So let's go to the next um, slide. So what we decided um, was that one path to this kind of um, vision of sustainability um, would be looking for examples where we are already mainstreaming open ed. Um, so we. Um, we had an analogy that um, I actually saw it sort of fly by in the chat earlier this morning. So, um, you know, online education was once um, viewed as being only about distance as education. And now we see that it's really integrated, especially right now. Um, but even when we had on campus courses, you know, we often had a course shell in the learning management system, even for a course that was taught fully on campus in person. Um, so the way that online education has been mainstreamed. So um, the question that we were asking is, you know, where are there examples of open ed already embedded into existing processes and workflows and procedures? And, um, you know, to what extent can we be creating something that's a living collection um, that keeps growing as we find new examples that we want to share? So let's go to the next slide. And um, this is one that um, Kevin put together. And um, I think he's in the room. And Kevin, if I, I didn't prep Kevin, but if you um, want to turn on your mic and speak up a little bit about the SUNY Sustainability Toolkit, that would be great. And if not, then I'll do my best to cover it. 
I can just add just a, a, a very few words. Um, as we, as a, a group underneath Amy's leadership, we're exploring how to structure our conversation around sustainability. The folks at SUNY had put, already put together this, this wonderful resource that we used as a, a basis for the structure for our, our, our Google spreadsheet and collection. Um, what, what is wonderful about this particular resource, it's not just looking at sustainability from a financial standpoint, it's looking from an infrastructure and culture. And so you can see from the graphic on the screen that it details all of the various aspects of a, of a, of a college and institution a system and all of the different uh, variations of, of, of support that need to be uh, explored within this whole conversation of sustainability. I'm going back on mute. Thank you so much. And so let's look at the next slide, um, which is actually a link, which, um, so the link is tinyurl.com slash R-L-O-E sustainability. And Una, if you wanna um, click on that and um, guide us through a little bit of a tour. Yeah, I'm happy to do that, Amy, but we could, I think you're a co-host, so you can actually share, if you would like to share it, because I think you'll probably be able to move it uh, better than I am. Do you want to um, share your screen? I don't have the tab open. <laughs> okay, Liz has shared it and all of this. I'll do that. Is that Thanks, otherwise I'm happy to share it, but I thought it would just be easier for you. It would be less awkward. Okay. I think um, if you um, stop sharing your screen, then I'll be able to share mine. Okay. It, yeah. I'm sorry. I maybe I need to do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. We can see your screen. You might want to enlarge it just a touch mm -hmm. if you can. The font is a little bit small. How's this? Looks, yeah, that looks great. Thank you. Okay. I think it's moving slowly, and now I think it might have gotten too big. Um, so, okay. So the front page here um, has um, just some information about the project, um, and in particular under about this document, um, some information that helps to scope what we are collecting here. Um, and just as a reminder, like we really tried to stay focused on examples of OER being, um, existing examples of OER being mainstreamed already. Um, and then under the different tabs, we um, broke out our examples um, using the different section headers of the SUNY documents so that we could stay aligned with the work that they've already done. Um, and on each tab, um, we've got the SUNY definition here up at the top, and then um, a title and a creator and a license for folks who want to reuse a link, and then a brief description. And it looks like um, a bunch of people are in here, so um, do please feel free to continue exploring. Um, but um, I think what we should do, um, well, let's see, let me look at the chat. Do people want me to show anything in particular or having the link, are you okay to continue exploring on your own while we come back to the slides? Um, Amy, I think it might be useful just to take people through some of the tabs and, okay. you know, just because terminology can sometimes vary.
Okay, so here we here we've got our process tab. And so, what do, what does processes mean in this framework? Well, <laughs> it is I at know. the top. Sorry, I know it's it's at the top, and it's also like you know, as you're asking that, I'm like, you're right. I haven't looked at this tab in you know weeks, um, and looking at what we've got. Um, you know, it seems like it's a variety of processes, a lot of it having to do um, with like student discovery of like processes that have to do with how students discover no cost and low cost courses. Absolutely, yeah, looks good. We've got professional development. We've got platforms here. And so are these platforms for development of OER? Um, uh, technology platforms and processes, okay. And also it looks like measurement as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that the way that SUNY has it is it's really like any kind of platform and we thought Abby's really beautiful spreadsheet um, about commercial platforms in here. Um, it seems like the class schedule is being thought of as a platform itself. Um, so yeah, maybe that there might need to be like a final sweep for um, like how things are organized or where they're categorized. Um, you know, now that we're coming back to it with fresh eyes. People in organizational framework. Um, this has a lot to do with position description. Promotion and tenure as well. With finance though. Efficiency. Vision and strategy. I think we wound up not managing to put anything under here, which I, I don't think that that's because it doesn't exist. I think it's that we haven't collected it. Um, and then communication. There were some fun ones here and finally metrics. And this is wonderful. I mean, everyone's ooing and ow wowing, um, but they're wondering if it's okay for them to contribute. Yeah, so let's come back to the slides actually. Um, we've got 10 more minutes for our work group and um, if folks wanna keep on exploring, you've got the link in that great um, but I would love to just turn it over to questions and comments um, it seems like um, in terms of the comments so far Spencer would love to help build out the finances tab thank you um, Wade is taking notes and I'm sure he has written that down um, James says if we want to add to the toolkit how do we do that um, do you have, did we share it with edit permission? Um, I believe it was editable until recently. Um, I don't. I'm checking right now. Um, yeah, anyone with the link can edit. So I would say go ahead and add. Um, and then in terms of the questions, um, we're kind of covering the first one, what can we add? Have we missed good examples that are in the scope of what we're trying to do here? Um, the group also wants to know how will this be useful? How could it be more useful? Those are related but different questions. Um, and then um, since it is a sustainability group and the project hopefully will be sustainable, um, are there existing projects or communities that could host 
this project in the future because I think that the work group um, at this point needs to move the project out of active mode and into maintenance mode. So if there's a group that um, already has energy and capacity for maintaining something like this, um, you know, I think that the work group is feeling like, yeah, let's hand it off for its next stage of existence. Um, so I will um, turn off my mic for a second and see if people have questions or comments. Thank you, Amy, for that. Um, this obviously is something that's of great interest to the CCCOER community as well. So we we hope to uh, certainly share this. And um, I think there's interest in maintaining this. And that'll be something that um, we'll look at um, over the summer, you know, because these projects are um, the first phase is completing in the fall. That's That's been our plan. Of course, the pandemic has <laughs> <laughs> has thrown a lot of plans uh, awry. Um, but I, I would just put that out there that um, Amy that and, and a Amy and I have shared this before that CCCOER is interested in um, um, these resources. So, but we also happy to work with other communities and collaborate on it. We've had some interest about um, financial uh, disruptions in the chat window, and I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that. Um, it's not the most pleasant subject, but it is certainly something that is is likely to affect open education efforts if it hasn't already. So I have a comment related less to financial stability and more about the usefulness of this project, because I think one of the things that we're asking here is how can the Arlo community, how can people here use these resources? Um, and I really love the ability to say, to do an assessment of the sustainability of the OER project at my institution and then say, oh, I'm missing something. Um, or this seems weak and go see what other institutions have done using this tool. I think it's beautiful for that purpose and can help guide some of the work around the thinking that's happening at other institutions and recognizing and thinking that. And I think it's another way we met, Amy mentioned earlier that when she started this work, she made cold, cold calls to people. Um, and it kind of gives me a sense of, oh, if I'm really having problems with um one of the areas of sustainability i can cold call somebody from one of those tools <laughs> love it yeah thank you for that quill i think um in a sense it's a it's a mentoring tool of sorts um and i love that idea of um institutions looking uh, what am I missing? You know, what what have others done? And you know, looking at these amazing resources that have been collected by Amy and and her entire team. So one other thought that um, circulated um, in a work group email thread is whether there's a companion piece needed to go with it, um, you know, maybe a CCC OER blog post um, that introduces or contextualizes what's been created. Um, so I just wanted to sort of put that idea out there as well. I think it's a good one. So Amy, you're saying that this work could be contextualized um, in different ways to support different needs. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Um, so what I took away from the message that I got was more like, um, you know, a, a blog post that says like, hey, we're highlighting the existence of this and sort of what it's for and how people can add to it. Okay, yeah, I, I was just trying to clarify <laughs> what you were saying and it's probably just 
I'm ending up being distracted by the people cutting my lawn. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for Darcy for for uh, sharing that. Yeah, so um, that sounds like a great way to um, to share and and maybe get more input as well, Amy. So Amy, are, are you still there? Yeah, I was pausing to see if more people were gonna um, jump in, but I think, um, you know, people, um, I'll, I'll put my email address in the chat and people can um, kind of continue to mull this over. Um, and the document is open um, with editing permissions. So, um, you also don't need to send me an email just to jump in and start um, adding, um, you know, taking care with the scope of the collection and the definitions at the top of each tab. Um, and if people have other feedback to share, um, you know, emailing me or continuing to use the chat today is also fine. So thank you. Thanks very much, Amy. Um, any last any last questions or comments for Amy before we move on? It looks like there's some real interest in the SUNY OER framework, and um, you know, making sure that we reuse that. So thanks to. Amy and Kevin for um, bringing that into uh, their work. All right, um, Liz, did you did you want to stop and? Re All right. Uh, next up is Quill West, um, who is the Open Education Project Manager at Pierce College in Washington State, and. Uh, I apologize for not introducing Amy. I was distracted when we when we got to her session. Uh, and Quill is going to talk about a really exciting area, the professionalism of the open educator. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Quill West. I use she, her pronouns. And um, I am definitely going to talk about professionalism of the open educator and what our team has been doing. So first, I want to say thank you to the professionalism team. Um, go ahead. Move on to the next. It's a pretty big group of people, um, and they've done some amazing work helping to collect documents um, and rethink what it means. So, um, and and really, we focused this time on professional development um, and kind of defining what does it mean what are the skill sets you need to have to be a professional in open education or that are useful if you're looking for that so um, moving to the next slide um, so our we started with the questions of what are professional practices um, and how do people find out about them how do they become a part of those fields um, and then what do employers do? How do employers evaluate this? And is it something that employers are actually looking for? Um, so we're really, we're just trying to find um, answers to these questions. And we started by saying, let's define some roles of what people do in open education. Um, and then let's see if we can define what the competencies within those roles are. Um, so Una, if you'll jump us forward. Um, so here's a sample of what we were kind of looking for. So revising OER is something that discipline faculty do, publishing librarians help with, instructional designers help with, K-12 educators. So you can see that it kind of maps to a lot of roles in open education. Um, a lot of the jobs that people do to support and sustain openness. Um, and so we were working with that kind of definition, revise OER, um, and then we wanted to go out and figure out where are the professional development opportunities that somebody could learn this. Um, and so Affordable Learning Georgia has a tutorial that talks about what does it mean to revise OER. 
And so um, in a simple, like using our spreadsheet model, um, this is what you'd be able to do. You'd be able to go, I need to know how to revise OER um, because, or I need to know how an instructional designer can learn about revising OER and click on that and follow it through to a set of training. Um, that's what we hope to des divine, design um, and make easy right now. This all exists in the form of a spreadsheet. Um, and so Una, I'm actually going to ask if I can share my screen now. And I didn't do a tiny URL. I just did a really long Google spreadsheet list. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, Oops. And of course, Zoom is going to show me everything so I can't find my correct spreadsheet. Um, okay, here it is. So the professionalism group will note that this is a much smaller spreadsheet than the master one we're working off of. I made a second one that uses the, um, the roles that we have defined more expressly. Um, so there's, we actually started with something like 20 roles. <laughs> um, and some of them I realized um, may not need professional development. They may just need advocacy work. Um, so it, one of the things I'm going to ask today is if you have a role that you think actually really there does need to be professional development or there is professional development around that and we need to add that role to this spreadsheet. Um, so if that's the case, please let us know. So, um, and can everybody see the spreadsheet okay? Yes, it looks fine. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and start with um, discipline faculty as a definition of how we um, found the roles um, and what skill sets they need in openness. So um, we focus just on like there's a bunch of things that discipline faculty need. Um, in order to do their jobs that is not necessarily related to open education and we didn't list those things. Um, but we did list things like, oh, understanding copyright and fair use. And then we tried to provide a, a description of that competency and why it's important. Um, and the reason why is because eventually we would like to break these down into um, kind of controlled vocabulary to use librarian speak. Um, and um, so that we can more easily map to the professional development options that are out there. So you'll see that we've done this for um, discipline faculty um, and we're kind of in varying stages of completion here. But you can also see instructional designers, for example, we kind of have a big list of skills um, and not a lot of description about why it's important, but we're getting there. Um, one of our most complete areas is um, in the librarian's field. And the reason why is because there are a lot of existing documents that show, for example, job, um, um, job descriptions for instructional librarians who do OER or for librarians in the open education space. There's such things as OER librarians. Um, as far as I'm aware, a lot of, and this is something to note in our fields, um, there's a lot of disciplined faculty who do OER work because they care about it and their ins institution has um, made it part of their professional responsibility, but there's not people who are hired just to be OER faculty if that makes sense. Like it usually happens from within the institution. Whereas there are many, there's an increasing number of OER librarian positions um, in the United States, definitely. Um, another field that we really want to grow into, and I think we have a weakness here as a group, is we really wanted to do some work with K-12 instructors and figure out what competencies and skills they're looking for in open education or what a, a skilled K-12 open educator does um, and knows how to do, but we don't have any K-12 instructors <laughs> in our group. So it's just another area where I think we have some growth to do in terms of finding people to support us um, and to work with folks. So 
The other big thing that we have done with our spreadsheet is we started collecting professional development opportunities. <laughs> um, um, so what's out there? Um, what do they teach and the things that are out there? And how can we incorporate those skill set or how then can we map these professional development opportunities to the different roles so that a person who's new to open education or trying to find out about how to do open education can figure out which training might be most appropriate for them um, and we tried to find things that are both like institutional trainings um, but also bigger project trainings and things like um the spark leadership community like what is what are the things that are available to people what are things that they may have to apply for um eventually we'd like to have also like what is the regular sequencing around this so that you no one can plan ahead um anyway our goal here is then to have a tool for people who are new to the field or people who are advising people into the field um, for how to find out about professional development opportunities, but also what skills they need and will apply to open education. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now because I've noticed that a lot of chats have happened and I haven't been reading them. <laughs> um, thank you, Regina. We will include that. So the other thing actually is that link that I shared is editable. So some of you, if you have um, things you'd like to add, even if you don't have time to break down right now, all of the things that are in it, if you would pop your resources into the appropriate space in the um, in the document, in the spreadsheet I just shared, that would be fantastic and lovely. So we'd have a recommendation of it. Um, so for example, Regina, if you wouldn't mind popping that document from ISK me in, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl, very much for adding um, the, or for mentioning the OTN work. And again, yeah, we just need to add it to the spreadsheet. So if you wouldn't mind jumping in and adding it, that's one of the things we'd like to do. Una, can we have the slides back? Um, so um, the working draft of the matrix link is the same thing I was on. Um, but the idea is that people can use the matrix to find professional development, um, maybe write job descriptions, add to the sustainability of OER at their institution in that way, um, and eventually talk about what it actually means to be a profession, a professional in open education. And particularly, um, how are we making space in our profession for um, people who haven't been invited here before for a variety of reasons and what are the ways that we are not inviting them and what are ways that we can. Um, it, it, it would also be really useful, this is just me talking off the top of my head, but it would be really useful to compare what does it mean to be a disciplined faculty member who advocates for OER in the US versus other places and how can we draw relationships in the international space for for having good conversations about how to do this work. Um, yeah, Amy, good point um, that um, maybe part of this can be about breaking down gatekeeping. Like these are these are things that are useful in the field, but a lot of people have learned OER by doing it, um, but I think that that also is a privilege. It's a privilege that we get to live in a space where that happens. Um, and it, that's not true for new professionals necessarily, that they get the privilege and space to do um, open education because they want to. Um, how many people are part-time faculty right now who don't get to do that because they don't aren't afforded the freedoms that tenured faculty are, for example. Um, so that's one of the things that I think I want to add to our template conversation about the usefulness of this tool and the way that we um, 
speak about it because the last thing I want it to do is become a hardship for people in finding work. I want it to support them <laughs> in finding um, work that, that supports their effort. Um, okay, um, so we do have some questions, although I didn't put a slide in here about the questions. So don't go to break yet. Help us answer our questions and then go to break. So how can we use this tool or make this tool more representative of the open education field and movement and people that we want to work with in openness? Um, I'm asking the community here for feedback and how to get better. Quill, this is James. Hi, James. Hey, I don't want you to be, be hanging there with that silence. You're at, I, I agree that you're at asking absolutely the right question. And, and, and my silence is just that I don't know. Not that I think it's a bad question. It's an essential question. How do we bring in more voices? How do we not just sit here and wait for them? How do we actively seek out more voices? That is exactly the question I'm asking. And I was sitting in silence. I have, I have learned <laughs> to give people <laughs> at least 20 seconds because we have to put our thoughts together. And Zoom meetings, sometimes you can't even find, I forget to unmute myself when I'm talking. Um, <laughs> well, so, well, can I add some, some uh -huh. a comparison that might be appropriate here? At many of our institutions, when we recruit candidates for open positions, uh, we or our HR colleagues actively seek to uh, advertise in uh, uh, journals and advertising venues and professional associations that typically would serve an underrepresented or an under-resourced uh, population in our, in our uh, institutions. Is, so, so what are we missing there? Are there, are there uh, professional, are there organizations that do professional development for African American educators? Are there organizations, are there subsets of the American Library Association that uh, work with uh, uh, African American librarians in, in other communities? I just don't know that. But would those be opportunities? That's a good question. I don't know either, but I'm it's going in our list of things to explore. Um, I want to turn the the mic over to Elaine um, because she raised a good comment. <laughs> I, this is my dead horse that I beat, um, but I feel as if us having these group, Google groups and Spark and Library Association is a barrier. Um, I work at a two predominantly um, minority schools and the faculty aren't necessarily part of these groups or involved in this or feel included in these groups. So I very much like to, our communications need to be sort of more open and more searchable on the open internet because when people find out about OER, I've been at this for three years, I can't believe I still meet people that are surprised. But um, they, they just wouldn't even know where to begin. So I think that we just need to be a little bit more transparent in how we communicate as a community, even if so that people can see what we're talking about and be invited to the table. I know that that's vague, but that's my two cents. I love that. I love um, trying to figure out, and it actually leads to the next question that we have, which is where should this work live? That it would be more approachable, available, um, and, and in the space where people will find it and use it. Um, you're right, living in a silent Google Doc <laughs> is not a place to get it out in front of the world. So, and I think that this is, we're going to come back to this question later today as well. Where should the Arlo group work live? Because we're trying to produce things that will serve the community. And when I say the community, I mean not the echo chamber we tend to chat into, but the wider, higher education, actually education in general space. Um, and I think we've had some interesting conversations about groups that are, we don't mean to be closed, but we are. Um, and, and we're closed groups because we don't know how to be 
bigger. <laughs> um, so I think we need to be talking about what does that look like. Um, yeah, so Rebel, that's an interesting thing as we were talking earlier today about leadership. I was, one of the things that in the past has kept me from wanting to be the voice for regional leadership in my area or that kind is, is that there is somebody in my state who has a job description that makes them the leader of open education in our state. Um, but I've been a long time voice in this space um, and I feel like I staked my claim, but I have a lot of privilege in the way I was able to do that. How many people are out there who have, whose jobs don't say they're a leader in open education, but who are leaders in open education or who are potential leaders in open education? And how are we letting job descriptions or um, practice or closed spaces keeping them from being those incredibly stellar voices? So, so Quill, just to jump in, this is Paul, and thanks for presenting out on this work. It's good, good stuff. Um, I just want to kind of reference the comment that I just posted into chat, which is um, as we look at how to invite more voices and kind of uh, make this more broadly available and more invite more participation, it's worth noting that that kind of on the international level, there is now the formation unesco has formed something they're calling the dynamic coalition but the dynamic coalition will have working groups and one of the working groups um, will address what's being called capacity building and that's one of the action areas of the oer recommendation but in capacity building there is uh, an emphasis on professional development and how to uh, put in place a means by which people can acquire the necessary skills and competencies to author and reuse and adapt and so on. And so I think that um, in some ways this work is ahead of what that dynamic coalition will end up working on, but ought to act as a great starting point. So this is really good stuff. And I think that over time we'll see more diversity in terms of voices and uh, a broader representation of what's happening around the world. Thank you, Paul. I love, really love to hear about those things. And also, I love that that group sounds like a superhero team. Um, <laughs> um, I'm wondering um, for folks here then, uh, and, and I don't want to put anybody on the spot, and I don't know that anybody has completely thought this through. I know I've been struggling with it for a while, but um, what is the space that will best reach out to people who aren't hearing us? And I guess I'm going to ask that you answer that question in um, the survey at the end of today, if there's room for it there, Una, or um, via chat here if you're not ready to speak out loud. Um, and I've seen a couple of ideas already, which is great. Um, but I think um, in preparation for that UNESCO group, I would love to have some um, advice and some work done based on what we've done here. Um, thanks, Quill. Yeah, we do have a question in the um, uh, uh, question regarding um, bringing more people in, in the um, survey. And there's also a general question at the end where you can share additional if you'd like. So it's open-ended. We've had some really great comments um, about, um, <clears throat> you know, who's, whose responsibility is it is and so forth. And I, I'm sure you're reading those as well. Um, Jenny Parks had kind of an interesting question about um, credentials, badges, and certificates. Um, and I know this is something CCCOER has been exploring for a while too, and something that we may look at. Um, Creative Commons, of course, offers um, certificates, if you will, uh, for, um, for their Creative Commons classes. I think, and we had some conversation about it too, and the role that OEC maybe plays in that conversation, mostly because in, 
uh, um, October, we had the benefit of having Paul at the table. <laughs> so we could all look to him and go, OEC can do this, right? And, and I think where we landed was we actually needed better definition of the types of micro or badging credentials that are needed before we could, like, we didn't want to live in the space where we were recreating a wheel that already exists just for the benefit of putting another name on it. Um, so we wanted to look at what's out there and be able to be supportive of um, prior learning and um, of not, we didn't want to create something new that already is there. Does that make sense? Um, And um, yeah, thank you for that, Quill. And I, I, I noticed Judith mentioned that um, Digitex, which is um, her organization in Texas, um, is releasing a Texas Learn OER, sorry, Texas OER Learn, which will give um, Texas, that's focused on community college uh, faculty and staff, uh, a certificate uh, upon completion. Um, and Elaine mentions that some of the training is cost prohibitive and um, it is true that the Creative Commons one does have a fee and that might be a barrier. I mean, I, I would certainly think that that could be a barrier for those who aren't currently in the field and can't get, you know, can't get their institution to help, uh, particularly if they're adjunct. I think all of those are really, um important things to note and I'm excited to learn about a new training that we might put in our thing um, and Elaine you're right it's $500 to do the, the Creative Commons um, trainings and I think the other issue with them another barrier I mean $500 is a significant amount of money um, for some a lot of people um, but the uh, another barrier with some of the trainings that are out there is the um, space in them, right? Even people who wanted to do the Creative Commons trainings in the beginning, those slots filled fast. <laughs> um, and so there wasn't even a lot of opportunity in terms of you didn't meet registration deadlines. Um, so I think that those are all things we need to be considering and finding ways to address um, and, and address in ways that are um, a, that that support people who may not know even that they want to do this work yet. Um, and Rebel, I think that's true too. Like you know, some of us were like, I have to go get a certificate and something I, I've been doing for a long time. So how do we add badging for demonstrated skill sets? Um, how do we um, help people who I don't know, took a college class and learned about open education there um, as part of a curriculum, get that on their resume. How do they talk about it on a resume so that an institution will recognize it as valuable? Um, these are all really important questions that I think we need to deal with coming out of defining professionalism. So some great comments in the chat window. You, you might want to address Quill for people who might be, there, there's a number of people who have phoned in and they might not be able to see the chat window. Oh, okay, all right, that's a good point. <laughs> I'm not reading them, I'm reading them and trying to decide how to respond to them. <laughs> Sorry. I, I can um, also read them if it's easier. Um, so there are a lot of comments about um, like how what is how do we honor hands-on learning or I taught myself or I've developed skills over time um, with micro badges or other things um, and Jennifer I may I, I have questions about your response so it looks like your organization does um, bulk pricing so 
and and I'm guessing that this is another place where regional groups can do work for us or help us. And I know, for example, if somebody wanted to look at the Creative Commons um, licensing system, I think, um, or credentialing, I, I think that it, the original plans, and it's been a while since I've checked in on this project, but one of the things they might have wanted to do was do like, oh, if an institution wants to pay to do this for a series of faculty, we'll hold a specific course just for that institution, um, for the faculty credentialing. Um, so if you're talking about that kind of um, contracting to get bulk um, registration in a particular area and pay for it in a central place instead of having individuals pay that $500, that might be really interesting and it might be a model if an, if a region is interested in um, credentialing using some of those pay, pay for models. Um, a lot of work in OER is done with an open license and following something like a MOOC model where people are <laughs> um, volunteering their time to learn things um, and the credential is more for themselves um, because we don't have a central system around that. Or I think that that's maybe what that addresses. Um, Rebel, can you say something? I'm not sure about the ancillary platforms that you're describing in the chat. So Jenny was asking about the bulk discounts offerings or that she might be able to help us with. And I was saying that any of the ancillary platforms offerings is one of the areas that I know our institutions are buying um, on a one-to-one -one basis. So that would be something. And as FLBC, we're looking into closed captioning options and contracting for that. So we would definitely um, be looking for some support there if possible. So this is Jenny. Sorry to jump in, Rebel. I'd love to talk to you about any of those opportunities. We are really eager at MAC to bring our experience with um, collective purchasing and um, negotiating terms of services that, that really optimize opportunities for educators um, to the OER space. So anyone who'd love to, I'd love to hear from anyone who can give me some ideas and, and get us really headed on a good path there. I love when connections happen in the middle of webinars. This is great. I, I'm running out of time, but I do want to bring in, and I love the connection of the Texas Learn project um, and how it came from a Sparks Fellowship um, that was excellent, I happen to know, <laughs> because I was the mentor on it. Um, but I am really impressed with, um, the connections that happen in the open space. And I really want to note that part of the reason why we wanted to do this matrix is because there are so many opportunities out there for people to learn about OER, um, but they're kind of diffuse and it's important to, we wanted to bring them together so people can find them and use them and improve where they want to and make connections and use it for mentorship and all kinds of things. Um, so that's partially why we wanted to do this research and figure out what's out there and be able to give a voice to the wonderful work that people have been doing. So Una, do you want me to turn it back over to you? Um, well, thank you, Quill. Um, I think this is time for us to take a break and I know quite a few people need to do that. <laughs> so, um, we, uh, the plan is to, um, you caught me right in the middle of a chat. The plan is to have a 15 minute break and we will be back. Go again. <laughs> I'm here. All right. Thank you, James. Let's give people one more minute. Oh, yeah, it's at 117. So we probably should get started again. I know it's, it's getting late for some of the folks who are um, on the East Coast. So thank you all. I hope you're able to grab a quick drink or something to eat. And we're going to continue with our next uh, um, presenter, which is James Clapper Grossclag, um, who leads the Stewardship of Content and Student Data uh, Workgroup.
Okay, thank you, Una. Thanks uh, to everybody. Glad to be back. Hope everybody had a, had a good break. Um, let's uh, move on to the next slide, Una. Pretty please. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So I had have, have had the great pleasure uh, of working with uh, yet another collection of amazing colleagues um, on this particular uh, subgroup around stewardship. Uh, you'll see the names here, Matthew Bloom, uh, Michael Mills, Cindy DeMica, Judith Sebasta, uh, Brittany Dudek, Deepak uh, Shinoy, uh, Preston Davis, Andrew McKitty, and Nathan Smith. And forgive me if I'm leaving anybody out, holy cow. Um, um, this has been a, a really interesting uh, project or subgroup to work with. Uh, and, and we were animated by the larger, I think we were all animated by the larger question of stewardship. What does stewardship mean? Let's go on to the next slide, Una, please, or Liz. Uh, so let's, let's dial back to the definition. Uh, stewardship is an ethic that embodies the responsibility, uh, planning and management of resources. It's generally recognized as the acceptance or assignment of responsibility to shepherd and safeguard the valuables of others. Uh, that's, I think that strikes all of us as uh, ringing true for both uh, openly licensed resources uh, as well as uh, again, an emerging field. Uh, if, if we don't control our destiny as a field, who will? And we, we want to make sure that, we're, I want to make sure that, we're, that we are directing our, our efforts. Um, so some of the questions that, that animated our initial discussion arise from uh, what we, I, I hope we all see happening around open washing and forced purchase programs uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, what's happening with our students uh, having to purchase access codes and, and not knowing what's happening to, uh, to our students once they're inside those, those uh, uh, platforms uh, that, that sometimes they're forced to, to purchase access to, uh, to uh, um, uh, redlining on, online and uh, uh, all the things that we're reading about and hopefully agitated about uh, tracking people online. Um, and then also within our field, within open education, we, we know that oftentimes our content, openly licensed content, is repurposed. Uh, if we put a CC BY on the content, it's repurposed. And, and what happens then is, is our content somehow being used uh, to entice students to uh, wander into uh, uh, a platform in which their data is going to be extracted. Are we responsible for that? What do we, you know, is, is, a, is a CC BY license really the ethical stance these days? Or, or should we, uh, is, is it ethical to put more restrictive license on things these days, knowing what we know? So, so that, those were kind of the big picture uh, questions that, that got us a, a bit riled up at the beginning of a long discussion. Uh, and, and we uh, decided at the end of that discussion to uh, use a fantastic tool uh, that already exists as a, as a jumping off point. And next slide, please, Liz. Um, and that is the CARE framework. Hopefully we are all familiar with the CARE framework that came out in 2018, uh, authored by Lisa Pedrides, Doug Levin, and Edward Watson. Um, and uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see an illustration of the four uh, uh, points around which uh, the care framework is, is organized, suggesting that good stewards uh, who take care, uh, good stewards do, do generally the following. They contribute, they attribute, they release, and they empower. And there, there's a lot more to this document, of course, and I'm going to hope that, that most of us are familiar with this. Uh, so we've had a lot of discussions over the past few months around how we would like to respectfully expand on the care framework. Uh, we tossed around some ideas about uh, also uh, developing a separate document that would be student facing. Uh, we had once referred to it as a student bill of rights, but then we realized, gosh, it, it kind of sounds pretentious that we, you know, we would, we would uh, uh, be able to, to delineate uh, uh, all the rights to which students are entitled. Um, 
and we had an incredibly helpful and, and inspiring conversation, or some of us did, a couple of weeks ago with Lisa Petridis and Doug Levin, who were incredibly generous with their time. And, and Doug Levin suggested that we think about it as the student perspective as a pledge to students. So we pledge that when we're engaging in these activities, we respect or take care in these other ways. So um, with that, um, I'm going to tur turn, turn the microphone over to a couple of colleagues who have helped to drive forward our conversation. Um, on, the, on the left hand side of the screen, you see some of the, the big picture themes that, that our group has, has um, focused on. Uh, what we propose concretely is to add another layer to the care framework, uh, expanding on it, perhaps in quoting it a bit uh, around some of the uh, emerging concerns that, that I mentioned around data and surveillance and, and reuse. And then now, you know, more recently, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of questions out there about the power relationships uh, that, that, that occur in, in, in the profession. Uh, as well as between students and, and faculty. So I'm gonna turn this over to Judith first and then Matthew, who are going to uh, share, share some, of the, some of the high level uh, thoughts and, and, and comments that, that our group has, has uh, landed on. And then we'll, we'll go to the next slide and, and get your, your feedback on whether you think we, this would be useful. But we're not gonna go to that next slide yet. Um, uh, so I'll turn this over to Judith first and then Matthew. James, thank you so much. And I really, I, I just am so appreciative of having this group working together and meeting today. It really does my heart good, um, I have to say. So, uh, you know, I, I think your just very general overview was quite, seems to me quite accurate accurate in terms of the discussions that we've had around the care framework. And we very much approached it out of deep respect for the work that Lisa, Doug, and uh, Edward did on the original version. And, you know, as I put it, it was a little like, you know, how do you improve on excellence, right? But I was there, I was there during the meeting with Doug and Lisa, and they were very enthusiastic about uh, our um, feedback so far and very open to it and, and, and a number of times said, yeah, we talked about that, but we just, you know, at that point we wanted to get it out in the world. I'm paraphrasing. Um, we didn't want to make the document too long. Um, so I think there's going to need to be that balance, in, for, in my opinion, between uh, ensuring that it's not too lengthy of a document, but that it's up, maybe uh, it's up to date and as effective as it possibly can be. And so James is right, we talked about data, primarily in terms of privacy, ethical collection and sharing of the data, responsibility of the community to regularly release anonymized data. We talked about our comments um, also were on issues of labor, fleshing out labor in the contribute section, and uh, including avoidance of exploitation of labor to develop and adapt resources um, and making sure that those who engage in that labor are appropriately cons uh, compensated. And there were a lot of comments around including the student perspective in the document. And um, so I, don't, I, I won't go into a lot of detail about that at the moment, but there just was a lot of discussion about making sure that the student perspective as both stakeholders, consumers and contributors would be included, um, and but that connects with obviously with the work of those working on a kind of uh, pledge to students. Um, so I think I think that's all I have to say. I know I think Deepak and Andrew. I know you were two of the first to comment on this. So James, I didn't know if we had a moment for them to. Sure, ab absolutely. Uh, but we want to be respectful of time. So deep, deep, and uh, and and Andrew, if you want to say a few words, and then we want to kick this to to Matthew to talk about the. Uh, focus on the students that we also develop. No, so, I, I, didn't, I didn't have anything much more, much more to add than you all have said. So, um, uh, great, I'll, thank I'll you. Pass. Yeah, me neither. Um, I mean, I think this, the focus, the bullet points here, I think cover it quite well. I, I think my, for my sake, I think I was the most interested in both the the data and consent stuff, and the the labor and power uh, structure. Just you know. I think as we've said a number of times before, whether this is in tenure and promotion or in professional development or any number of things, I think we need to sort of be very clear about the, the amount of work that goes into the, uh, to the contribute uh, end of things um, and, and, and really recognize that and value it. And Terrific. one more thing I'll add, um, and I think Nathan may be in the meeting, I don't know if he is right at the moment, but Nathan had brought up 
the point of looking at the UNESCO, the newest UNESCO guidelines and making sure that this aligns with those guidelines. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, a number of times we, we did refer to the U, UNESCO uh, uh, recommendation and we, we think that's, that's worthy of, of mentioning for sure. Uh, let, let's kick it over to uh, Matthew now. We, we had some good conversations with Preston around the student viewpoint. Matthew? Uh, hi, yeah. Well, um, I would just add to all of this, um, part of our kind of philosophical, I guess, discussion uh, was centered around this problematic, arguably problematic concept, kind of an archaic concept of the student instructor dichotomy or, you know, because there's a power relationship that's involved in that, that open education and especially open pedagogy um, tends to destabilize. And so we wanted to recognize that and try to see if we couldn't figure out some way to articulate uh, you know, a critique of that traditional power structure in a way that maybe corresponds to or is in addition to the empower uh, component of the care framework. So, um, you know, before I get into more of the, you know, specific things that we thought, a couple of specific things that we thought we would add in terms of a pledge to students or learners, because we still want to recognize the fact that, you know, it's a complex thing because students come to institutions and there is an, there is an explicit power structure um, that they are, you know, interacting in. And so there's nothing that we can necessarily, we can't change that entire system overnight. But one, and so we have to recognize that there is also kind of a mastery involved in, um, you know, the, the, those who are instructing have gone through, uh, you know, years of, of education and, and do possess uh, a certain kind of expertise or mastery that we would expect those entering into a field not to have at, in the same way. But as we know, open pedagogy is is you know leveraging the permissions of the open license to directly engage students in the creation of global knowledge in a way that recognizes that they are already creators our students are coming to you know even first year as an english instructor first year composition classes having already created all kinds of videos on youtube and shared those some of which have way more views and likes than any video I've ever created, right? So we can kind of recognize that and what the care framework may, what we can use the care framework for in a sense is to maybe focus on how just in general, open education does promote, uh, the, the access that's promoted by open education removes the barriers uh, from all learners, whether those learners are instructors or those learners are students, we're all creators. And if we're engaging in open education, um, you know, either as co-creators with our students or just seeing what our students are creating. Um, we wanted to try to articulate some of that complexity in the empower component there. Um, kind of woven through that is this idea that, and I'm actually reading some of the, the draft that we've, we've drafted some language that, that we, uh, I, I'm assuming we'll share with everybody. It's all in one word document. James, I'm not sure if we want to like put that in a chat or if we want to, you know, somehow put it in a Google Doc or something. Yeah. But what we're trying to kind of think about is how well, we are stewards, I'm reading it here, acknowledge that the distinction between content producer and consumer is reflective of an old and increasingly irrelevant model of publishing. When this is applied to the relationship between student and educator, the old model uh, reifies the notion that students are consumers slash recipients and educators producers slash knowledge. And I think that that, that kind of gets to uh, what we wanted to articulate there. Um, and then just in addition to that, I'm sure there's a lot of discussion to be had over this, but in addition to that, the last thing I would like to add before kind of opening it up to Q&A or passing it back to James um, is to just say the two really specific points that we would also like to somewhere incorporate uh, into the care framework as a pledge to students of some sort. Uh, a couple of points that we are starting with is number one, um, promoting the opportunity for learners to exercise informed consent with respect to the release of one's intellectual property under an open license. Uh, and the second one is uh, stewards promoting learners' rights to know where and how their learning data is collected uh, and the ability to control or use or own that data as an individual. We feel like those are two really important components along with the kind of larger um, attempt to address that archaic power dynamic that that consistently plagues also just pub publishing in general. So I think that's um, pretty much all I have to say. Does do you think I, I hit everything there, James? Excellent. Thank you, Matthew. Really appreciate that. Let me 
uh, also recognize that uh, Lisa Petridis has, has <laughs> generously made the time to join us uh, uh, for a few minutes today. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, I'm gonna, I wanna turn the mic over to, to, to Lisa in a minute if she's able to, um, but I'll, I'll say that our, our document right now is pretty darn drafty. Uh, we will be sharing it. Our, our output at, at the end will be a document. We're not, we haven't quite settled on, on how to um, uh, uh, craft the, the expansion or the overlay or the update on top of the care framework uh, next to the original. You know, we're, we're still toying around with that. Um, uh, we, we do have a hypothesis document going. Um, so, so, you know, I think that's still, still evolving the, the final output, but a document will, will emerge from this. Um, and, uh, before we go to the next slide, I wanted to see if Lisa is able to, to say hi and, and, and share any, any observations or thoughts. Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank you, Lisa. Great. Um, thank you so much for letting me sit in on this today. I just want to, first of all, just voice my complete support on behalf of the other authors that whether you want to, I like how you just said that, James, whether you want to put it on top of next to or in any, you know, or remix it in its entirety. Um, we would just be delighted that this is, you know, seen as a jumping off point. Um, many of the issues that you've all raised here, um, like Judith said in the introduction, are things that we talked about. We talked about examples, um, but we had decided that the first version of the care framework really needed to be um, a bit more kind of aspirational and, and leave room for exactly what it is that you're all doing now. So um, just uh, we, and we, so we'd love to, you know, as the original authors, step back and let you remix. Uh, contribute if you'd like us to uh, in any way, shape, or form. This was really meant to be a, um, a document around dialogue and to continuing this. We've talked about doing a 2.0 version. Maybe this is the 2.0 version. So um, just thank you again for um, uh, inviting me to kind of sit in and listen to hear what some of your thoughts are. Um, so far, I'm just really liking what I hear and it aligns so well with um, our conversations in terms of the authors of this. So thank you, James. Thank you so much, Lisa. That's really, uh, really uh, uh, fantastic. I, I just don't know how to express our gratitude and, and, and our excitement that, you know, the authors and, you know, people who, whom we all admire and who have done foundational work in the field are, 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 are okay with what we're doing. So thank you for that. Um, then uh, Liz or Una, can we go on to the next slide, please? And, and so we've got some questions here. Uh, we'd like your feedback on, and I have not had a chance to look at the chat yet, uh, but the, the, what we'd like to know is, uh, uh, have we missed anything and what, what should we add um, along with how will this be useful and how could it be more useful? And then finally, what projects or communities are doing similar work or uh, what projects and communities could enrich this perspective that we're bringing to it? So I'm just gonna open it up to, to the floor um, hopefully you can unmute yourselves or uh, let us know in the chat what your thoughts are. Hey James and team, this is Paul and, and Lisa. Thanks so much for allowing the use of the care framework in this way. I, I, I guess I, I just wanna ask maybe a question around what the group's scope of focus has been. When I reflect back on the definition of stewardship that you shared, you know, there's a there's a kind of ethic and social system in play there that is involved with responsibly planning and managing the resource pool, and it feels to me like this is still uh, an un, um, you know, we don't really look at this very closely, and that is, by what means are we managing the open education resource pool that is being collectively created by students and instructors together? Um, we, we have repositories, of course, but that's just simply a, a kind of place where they're put. We, it feels to me like we have a lot of work to do to, to kind of enable the creators to have their own right to know, if we will, around 
how and where their resource is being used. And, and also I feel like the lot, a lot of creators would value collaborating with other creators who have a shared interest in that resource. And so part of stewardship, I think, is forming, let me call them uh, kind of micro groups that all share a common need and interest in a set of resources. And those micro groups might then take on some responsibility for the stewardship of those resources going forward. And, and it's that kind of um, stewardship role around the management of the resources and the need for some sort of ethical social system that enables that, that I'd love to also see included here. But thanks for this great starting work. I think it's really good. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I, I'm pretty confident nobody in our group would, would dispute that, that, that your, your encouragement to uh, consider uh, the larger uh, ethic of stewardship and the role of creators is, is valuable. Um, I also uh, am pretty confident that we, we did not touch on that or have not touched on that yet. Um, it might be a, a, an accident of, uh, of just uh, the, the the timing or who who had input, uh, so thank you for that. We will we will definitely consider that, and th but that also might be version three point <laughs> um, So yeah, thank you. Other comments? How about will this be useful? It, you know the the care framework. I, I'm sure kicked off a lot of reflection and conversation. Uh, throughout the open education community um, to have a document that expands on it, perhaps providing some examples. And, and most generally from a practitioner perspective, those of us who are at colleges or universities trying to be the, the uh, advocate for open education uh, while we're also juggling 10 other hats, um, I think that's probably the predominant perspective for, for those in our group. Uh, would this be useful, this kind of uh, document? Great. Amy notes that uh, could the 2.0 be released with examples of the framework and practice? Yes, Amy, definitely that's, that's one of the ideas we have entertained. And I, I'm, I know Lisa and Doug, when we were able to meet with them, they also encouraged that. Um, yes. Um, and, and Nathan notes in the chat that he agrees with Paul, uh, who raises a deep set of questions around the nature of the commons in OER, or whether a commons is even the right metaphor. Um, and thank you, Paul, uh, liking the notion of a pledge to students. Um, other comments? James, this is Mike Mills. Hey, Mike. How are you? One of the things that we had talked about early on with this pledge to students was how do we how do we internationalize it um, and and i think that's still something that we're going to have to struggle with um, and, and take a look at and and not just make it a, a united states thing uh, but but bringing it to a, a larger audience excellent point thank you for the reminder mike really appreciate that and and preston also in the chat uh, notes that our idea is to be as inclusive in, as possible. Absolutely, and I'm I'm guessing that that's one that was one of the challenges for the original authors, um, in in terms of including uh, examples. Right by 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 including an example of X, you're somehow excluding an example of everything else. Uh, but I also think for myself as a practitioner, it's always helpful to see examples. Um, Preston, uh, you want to talk a little bit more about the, the, the inclusiveness that we're talking about? Um, I'll just very briefly state that, you know, as, as you mentioned, James, this is a work in progress and, and it's somewhat philosophical in nature. And so how we, we take these uh, grandiose ideas and, and make them uh, applicable uh, is is the trick, but we're working on that, and I think that um, there is value to what will ultimately come about uh, in terms of inclusivity. You know, I think when we think about what Matt 
<clears throat> mentioned earlier about um, the dichotomy uh, that tends to separate uh, faculty and students uh, is something that we want to try to minimize by making sure that we're not inadvertently creating a marketplace that that exists for OD, for OER, but what we are doing is, uh, in a sense, creating an environment where everything that exists uh, is has has contributors that have very a variety of um, uh, experiences and and things that they can share, uh, so that we're not um, trying to reproduce uh, what we see as a, as a commercial enterprise, only taking out the commercial aspect, but really um, changing the way people share and create information. Thank you, Preston, absolutely. And, uh, and Amy notes in the chat uh, that examples can be informal. She reminds us that Nicole Finkmeiner sent a, uh, an email at one point walking through how that organization lines up with aspects of the framework. Ah, thank you, uh, Amy. I had forgotten all about that. And uh, Cheryl Collier also notes that the OTN, Open Textbook Network, has developed guiding principles. Thank you. We shall look at those. Appreciate that. Uh, if you have other uh, requests, examples, uh, other organizations doing similar work that could expand our perspective, please uh, feel free to reach out to me or, or anybody on our group. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn this back to Una. And thanks, thanks to everybody in the group. Thank you, James and the entire team. Great, great uh, discussion. All right, at this point, uh, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Denise Cote who's professor and librarian at College of DuPage in Illinois, uh, to talk about the team that she's leading on open education policy and implementation. And I would say that Denise is our last official presenter of the day uh, before we transition to um, the crosswalk and the community discussion. Thank Hi you, everyone. Denise. Thank you, Anna. So you guys wanna see something funny? I came home today and this puzzle a jigsaw puzzle was in my door. I have no idea who it's from. And there's also a note on it that there are pieces missing. And I'm like, what do you know about my life? Um, and, you know, I, and it's kind of like a metaphor for everything that I've been hearing today. And, um, you know, it's just a big puzzle and there are some pieces missing. <laughs> I have no idea where this crazy thing came from. So I'm going to have to go around to my neighbors and find out. Um, I have also lost power for a minute because we're having one of these weird Illinois storms. So um, my Wi-Fi isn't working. Um, so I'm connected to my phone. So thank the technology gods for 5G and for batteries. So I'm going to shut off my, um, my video just to reduce the load a little bit. Okay. So... Um, if that's all right, um, I know you guys don't need to look at my face, but um, the Arlo meeting in Phoenix was amazing. And um, if you could skip to the next slide, please. So um, this was my group, is my group, and I have a lot of really great people on this group. And I also wanted to thank Una, who's been holding my hand um, through this whole thing, um, making sure that I know what's going on and and I'm functioning well, and I appreciate that. And it's been wonderful to work with, um, with Quill and Amy and James. I feel like such a newbie, and um, I've learned so much just from listening to them talk um, about their work. And um, they welcomed me into the leaders group, which was amazing, so thank you. So um, our, my project is, um, our group project is a response um, to the challenge of finding examples of policies and best practice in the implementation of open ed programs. Um, and Rommel had mentioned, um, like finding this documentation is a pressing need for both seasoned and emerging leaders. So 
I mean, also hearing the stories of people, of regional leaders, state leaders, you know, how they got to a place where they have mature programs. So, um, and at the same time that we were talking about like, okay, we need to pull all these policies together and, and find a place for them. Um, the OER um, world map people called out to the community for a policy add-a-thon. Um, so we started talking about maybe working with them and um, adding, you know, formally working with them and adding documents to their database um, to make it a really useful and current repository. Um, the OER policy um, repository, um, the world map repository has been out there for a while, but they're re-envisioning it now. So um, we can go to the next slide. So I developed a policy, a purpose statement, because I need that, and um, we talked about it in our group. So this is what we ended up with, and I think we'll probably end up changing it a little bit. Um, so the purpose of the project is to identify and collect policies, procedures, and guidelines that address the implementation of state legislation regarding the use of open educational resources. And these materials will be housed in the OER World Map Policy Registry Database, and it's now called the Open Education Policy Hub. So I'm going to show you that. Um, if you go to the next slide. So um, this is what the Policy Hub does, and I'm going to share my screen in a minute. Um, but this is what they're hoping to do. Um, they're going to allow linking of policies and related resources. Um, and then they want to include also contextual and background information, such as reports, interviews, case studies. Um, the registry also will provide statistics and um, allow us to do some analysis of the data that's collected, which I think is really important um, to pull out that best practices thing. We need to be able to analyze the data that's already out there. Um, and also another thing, um, I'm going to show that, Liz, thanks. Um, the quality assurance mechanisms that they're talking about, um, they're gonna, there's an editorial team, so there are people, and it's also facilitated by technology, of course, um, but there's an editorial team that will make sure that um, when materials are put into this database that we are um, tagging them correctly, um, that they're linking together correctly. I think that's really important. Um, right now it's just collecting links and I'm really interested in making sure that documents can also be uploaded. Um, the last thing that we want in a database is a collection of Google Doc links um, and spreadsheets and things like that because those, um, you know, for the librarians in the group um, should give us hives um, to have a Google Doc in um, a database so um, because those things are not those are associated with an individual person's name rather than um, being something that's really stable so if I could share my screen for just a second absolutely okay thanks okay do you see pink we do okay so this is what um, they're working on now. What this is, is a discovery layer that's going to sit on top of the database um, to reveal um, just the policy pieces of this. So um, they have here um, what the Policy Hub is about, and this is just little placeholders. Um, but they're talking about here the registry. So when you would click on these, you can look at the statistics and some of the analysis of the, of the documents that live in the registry, or you can just search the registry. And um, so this, I'm just, these are just kind of slides that they, they gave me yesterday. So there's the statistics and how they are focused. Let me go back. And then, um, there's going to be resources here on how to create your own policies. Um, and also um, to build a network of people. So you could submit your name as someone um, that is an expert in your region, or it'll link together um, authors. 
of documents um, so you could contact them and then also connect to partners. So um, they characterize it as consultants. Um, so there's policies and then um, I'm really interested in this and I get like overwhelmed talking about it because we keep going back to it's mentioned repeatedly, where are we gonna store documents? And I like the, um, I'm gonna stop my share. And um, we can go back to the slides. Thank you. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So what I called out um, to our group for was um, people to give us um, their state legislation, um, any policies and guidelines, project planning documents that they have, state and regional reports, public links to their project pages, maybe repositories, and then institution level documents and project websites. I'm less interested in that last piece because um, it really gets into the weeds. But um, Spencer Ellis from Colorado was kind enough to do the work and put together a big collection of um, his policies that speak directly to state legislation. So if we can go to the next slide. So this was a meeting that I had um, recently with the uh, Policy Hub people. And I would like to say too that um, Una and I, before we even began talking really seriously about this, we met with Deep in the Doers Group. We met with Spark. So we met with um, Nicole and Haley about their work um, and Spark and how they're collecting documents. Um, we met with the Hewlett people and um, that was really good. And then we finally met with the Policy Hub group. And there's a nice synergy here because Hewlett also um, sponsors the work of the Policy Hub people. And um, I, we had a meeting too with the Policy Hub people and Paul was also there representing the OEG. And then Yesterday, when I, or the other day when I met with the Policy Hub people, they were telling me about the UNESCO Partners Initiative. So they're really super excited to have um, Spencer's um, material. He gave us a whole bunch of stuff to work with. And so we're gonna try and then lay this out using Spencer's documentation. And then and, and to try to like start working on um, subject headings and trying to get together how we would ask people to add their own policies. So um, if you go to the next slide. So the discussion that we had was around um, the documents that Spencer had sent. So it started off with his, um, the state policies that were um, from his legislation. And then um, we went through all of that and they're just super excited and really smart people. So they had a lot of ideas about how those things could be cataloged and entered into the database. And then we talked a little bit about having a pilot group. So having maybe if we could get together five or six pilot groups um, from states and um, ask them to submit their documents and then participate in the development of the metadata and the headings, and then talk about with them about quality assurance, um, how we would go about developing quality assurance um, guidelines. And um, then also later include case studies. A part of our um, original discussion in Phoenix was to do a series of video interviews of state and regional leaders. And we decided to table that just for a bit and um, work on gathering documents from the states. And I thought that it would be a good idea to interview or perhaps get narratives to complement the document collections. So if a person's, for instance, um, Spencer, um, after we got his documents in, we could um, talk to him or ask him to write a narrative to fill in the gaps, so those best, best practices kind of gaps. And um, I wanted to know what you guys thought of that. It's hard to, um, you know, I'm hesitant to ask people to pull together documents like this because it is, it is a lot of work, because Spencer had put together a very long list of documents. 
and it's a lot of work for the um, the OEG uh, the um, the hub people too. So, um, I mean, that's a really quick um, summary of what I'm doing. Um, yes, thank you, Tanya. So we can go to the next. So my questions um, for you are, and I know I, I could have spent a little bit more time in the policy hub, but I think you've all have seen it before. And a lot of us were like, wow, this is really great, but the documents in it are a little bit old. And that's exactly why um, the policy hub group is interested in pulling in US documents. And I'm also interested in participating um, at a global level. I, I met with Jan, who's from Germany, and um, Javiera, who's from Spain, Leo from England, and um, Fabio from Italy. And it's really great to participate at a global level. And I think that's kind of where we need to go. And um, we talk about it a lot that we you know we're kind of in our little bubble, um, our big, huge United States bubble. And there's a lot of good things happening in other parts of the world. And we're all talking about the same stuff. So um, when I was talking with with them the other day, it's like, wow, they're really trying grappling with the same things that we are. You know, how do we help emerging leaders? What do you do about professional development? What are you doing about um, their version of tenure and about financial things? So I think that we could really um, help each other. So um, my question is for you, do you think that the document types that we're asking for are appropriate? Should we make them more narrow? Is it too much to ask or should we expand it? Um, do you think that the pilot group trying to get five or seven um, states or regions together to get their documents together? And how important is it at this point to include perhaps institution level leaders that have a lot of documentation that would be useful? And then my last question for you, I guess, is if we asked you in an open call, um, how willing do you think you would be in just an open call to add to the registry? You know, I would, um, I guess, hate to do all this work, get all excited, and then put out a call and get crickets back because it is so much work and how we can make that easier. So those are my questions. I'm gonna try and turn my video back on. See if that's gonna work. Hi. Okay. So Denise, you had a comment here um, from, from Judith Sebesta as well. And she was asking, I think you can see that perhaps system level before institution level. And I think that's true that there is definitely a focus on the system and, and um, state. Level. Yeah, that's my thought too. Um, but some of the institutions are extremely large and have a lot of materials. So, but my thought was that we would start at the state legislation policy and then go down from there. Like we want documents that address legislation directly and then start moving, um, I don't want to say down, but you know, laterally to the institutions. Tanya. Hi, I have a barking dog. It really, it, I don't think you should feel bad about asking people to participate in this. I know you were like, oh, it's a lot of work. But for somebody who did this work, it's very exciting to share and it's not hard. So like I led the OER work in North Dakota. I know all the legislation. I know the story. I have all the reports. I could give it to you in like 10 minutes. So if you get to the right person, it's not a huge deal because this is what we do all the time and it's so easy for us to do that. Um, so don't feel bad about asking. Uh, I would just say ask the right person, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, the third point is, isn't there just a lot of information already out there? So this doesn't have to be started from scratch. I mean, there's OER state policy playbooks and policy, there's a lot of places that have state mm -hmm. policy already collected, so I don't, it doesn't have to be so hard for you. Right, that's what this, right. this, this project is trying to address is that it's everywhere and um, we're trying to get it into one 
try to get as much as we can into one place. So it's searchable, usable, current, and something that we can, that both emerging leaders and people that already know what they're doing can refer to or have a, another place for them to store um, their documents. Mm -hmm. So um, I think Spark has such a great collection of OER policy at the state level and good examples of um, you know initiatives and how it's implemented I think it'd be good to add to that if there's more but if it's that's where I would always start yeah we we did start at spark and the OER um, hub people the policy world policy people did start at spark and um, we met with Nicole and um, Gosh, her name is Haley, um, who manages the um, the state policy tracker. And what we're trying to do, they don't, um, Spark doesn't collect up all the documents and they have case studies that are really representative of what they're trying to, um, what they're trying to communicate in the state policy playbook. So um, what we're looking for is both, we wouldn't catalog the state policy playbook. What we're looking for is the state level legislation. And then in that state, everything that addresses did, that legislation. Did, can, I, can I add um, a thought? Yeah, talking? Yeah, this is Rebel. Hi, Rebel. Okay. So, um, Tanya, I just wanted to address that. We had thought about with this group is that like um, Denise said, they don't actually have the documents. So for someone like me in Florida, how do I know, how, do, how can I see how a policy was implemented in another state? Say we use OER icon as an example. So Texas has the legislation that has this mandated across the state. Is there documents or, or guidance that I can look from that they have and pull all that together and know what is actually still current if that makes sense um sorry to jump in no thank you that's that helped me so in you know for like state policy at the system levels a lot of that work would be hidden in minutes or in you know actions taken by boards and you might not you know someone would that might be really hidden but if you got right. the right person Say if you're talking to, um, uh, I'm trying to remember her, Bo Young, she would know everything, right? So um, if you get to the right person, that's how you get to all that information. Right. And the hidden stuff is what I'm, I'm really interested in too. You know, if we just Google for days, we could find a lot of stuff. But I'm interested in those documents that aren't published publicly like that um, also. So, um, you know, a lot of things that could be redacted if there was like, you know, money or names or something like that, but having examples of documents that people use to do the work that resulted in things that are on the web, um, that's what I'm most interested in, me personally. But um, the things that Spencer sent that were mostly public documents, but it was really useful to get started. So, um, yeah, let's see. Did, did you, yes, go ahead, please. This is James, can I uh, make, make a quick comment? Okay. Or maybe not so quick. Um, first of all, I think this is fantastic. Uh, and, and I'm excited because I, I see a lot of ties to uh, the other subgroups. Um, the, uh, you know, so that, so that this could be a tool for the professionalism group. It could be in, as part of part of the training to be, become a professional open educator. Um, of course, it's tied to sustainability that you uh, have have open or OER or funding or, or or course markings defined in legislation. Of course, uh, right. stewardship. I you know at some point some of the concerns around data and protecting students might appear as legislation, right? So this is, this is really fun for me to see the connections. Um, and then kind of a wish list, uh, is to, you, know, put it, you know, put it on, on, the, on the parking lot for you know, two years from now. Um, when I think about emerging leaders or people who are 
uh, getting into the field or poking around and looking at for policy because they're trying to accomplish something at their institution. A lot of times they, they might not know what level of policy even to look at. Right. They just know, hey, I want course markings or I want this for students or I want to do this. Um, so again, you know, like pie in the sky dream would be an index uh, that, right. that doesn't start with the level of policy, but rather starts with the action that one wants to have. Right. So. I think those are, so to uh -huh. add to that, like action that people want to have, I think it's um, really cool to find out how different states or entities or systems implemented certain policies or practice around OER. It's also um, not always helpful to others to see it or so one state works completely differently than another and how their boards are structured or governance or um, funding, timing, all kinds of things go into these kinds of um, efforts. And I mean, it's an, it's an interesting and heavy lift to, to try to find all these documentations, but um, it might also be kind of overwhelming for someone who's just starting to page through, um, you know, these origin stories of OER initiatives in the States. But I mean, overall, it's, it's really fascinating. I just, I think it's also maybe, you know, we'd have to make it super useful, right? So it's bite size. So somebody who's like, oh, how do I do course markings? Well, here's like five ways I could do it right off the top and not have to make it a labyrinth of difficult maneuvers made by the champions who uh, struggled to get this to happen because behind every one of these state wins is a myriad of pain <laughs> and, and difficulty that someone went through to make it happen and, and it's just not it's not a straight road right from A to Z anyway that's just my and we would sense because I did it yeah. it's, it's, we could we could tell you the story but it, there's no other state that could probably do it exactly like my state did and just like I couldn't do it like someone else did but well, it, it's still interesting this too is to capture those stories and we talked a lot about that in Phoenix is capturing the stories of the people that did the work because the you know the on the ground work is usually not represented in the resulting documents you know so um, you know taking a state's complete story, having their documentation, having their legislation or not, you know, as Nicole points out that, you know, policy is not always the best place to start. And um, so, and I, I, I do, I do want to have some sort of like research basis in this, you know, like eventually get to a place where we can do some empirical work on these policy documents and, um, and, and some qualitative work on it um, and interview people or write narratives or develop case studies around it that could be also a part of the policy hub. I'm really interested in working with them and I've kind of just put all my eggs in that basket um, because they're talking about the same stuff that we're talking about and they also have the tech and the servers and um, the people that want our documentation. So, um, so yeah, let me see what's happening in the chat here. No questions, just comments, yes. I also shared with them all of the case studies that are on the CCC OER website and they were kind of just like, yes, you know. So um, the next step for us is for, I don't know if Spencer was, is still here, I think he had to go. Um, early, but we're going to meet with um, Spencer to talk specifically about his documents. And so hopefully at the end of that, we'll have a collection of documents from one state and then start reaching out to people to participate in the pilot. So um, a very specific question, do you think that a pilot group is a good idea or should we just start trying to open it up to everyone? I really would like that pilot group myself, just because I love a pilot and um, and try to, be, so they can ask us questions about our documents because they're very different from, not very, but 
in some ways the language is different um, from the language that they use in Europe, so in their education documents. And also um, the quality assurance piece of it I think is important. And having, you know, just little things like the ability for an author to delete a document that they put into the um, policy hub so they could put a refresh document in it or to keep versions, you know, versioning of things is important. So, um, yeah, okay, plus one to the pilot. Okay. Are there any other comments? Super nervous today, too. So I'm still feel you know, like so green. Um, so I appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Denise. And you've gotten some volunteers here. So North Dakota's uh, signed up. And I, I, I know that you also talked with Kyla Torrey. And I, I, I know she was registered and, and she may have been here earlier, but apparently she couldn't make it today. But I know that she's also volunteered to help you with the Texas um, OER legislation and policy. And I know there was a great deal of that. Uh, available and Amy has also shared some resources and I don't want to <laughs> volunteer Amy but um, Oregon has some great stuff and um, I, I could mention my own state but uh, <laughs> so th I, I think a pilot is is really an excellent way to go and I think there's some really strong um, states to start with um, or either strong strong policy and legislation or strong interest great Thank you so much. All right, thanks everyone. Everyone still hanging in there? <laughs> so um, I know that some of you have to take off and some of you probably have already taken off. We do have a, um, a survey for folks um, and we'll share this to everyone who registered as well, but we have a little survey there asking you for some feedback on how it went for you today, um, you know, asking you for, um, thoughts you might have about uh, future uh, presentations like this. We're looking at doing another event like this, uh, potentially end of August or beginning of September. And I think we asked about that in the um, survey. I can't actually remember at the moment now, um, but would love to um, hear if that makes sense. And, um, I think at this point, we're going to go to the regional OER crosswalk, and then we have a community conversation following that. Um, and we're hoping to finish up in the next 30 minutes. Um, so on we go. And, and please, you know, feel free to step up if you've got questions here um, <laughs> while I'm trying to find my, my Google Doc. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay, so thank you all for your patience. It's been, it's been a great afternoon. I think for most of it's been an afternoon. For a few of you, it might have actually been a morning. Um, and here is our Arlo uh, virtual crosswalk. Um, it's not, it's Arlo in the sense that we're doing it here at this meeting. Can everyone see that? Or should I say, is there anyone who can't see that now? I think it looks good enough. Okay, thank you, Quill. So the way this is, or well, okay, so the goal of this is for us to look at the different projects that at least the four groups who've spoken today are, under, are underway with, um, wh where their focus is, and find out where's the intersections, how can we uh, collaborate and support each other um, on those. And so um, this crosswalk, um, has the projects across the top, I'm sorry, it has the um, group names across the top. So of course, Arlo, uh, the doers, the higher ed compacts, and then the OER state leaders that uh, Rebel is running. And then along the um, rows, we have actual projects. Um, in some cases, it's more of a focus, but uh, sort of projects and focus. And so um, what we've done is we've, um, taken all those projects and then for the different groups some have had a chance to uh, put those put their answers in whether they're doing that work or not and some haven't yet so i'm just gonna um i think i'm just gonna start here with um i wonder if i can make this a little bit bigger so people can see this is, is that helping at all in terms of enlarging this making it worse 
um, so uh, the first project was educating educators and um, both Arlo, uh, the higher ed compacts and um, the OER state leaders um, are interested in that. Um, and it, Tanya, you mentioned that yes and no. Did you, did you want to share what, what you meant by that? Um, so, I mean, the, there's no formal um, training program that we are starting up. We do, however, mentor the leaders in states, especially at the compact level. And then also, there's a lot of educating coming from me as someone who's very experienced in open education to the compacts themselves. So while the policy leaders at the state compacts um, we're really interested in a lot of equity work and had done a lot of initiatives in their states. They weren't particularly um, experts in OER. So that's been my role is to mentor them um, and establish other leaders. So I mentored Jenny and now she's leading in her states, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, Rebel, this was the one that you put this project in. Um, when we talked last week. And so do you want to speak to uh, how the Florida, sorry, your, your group that's running the state leaders is doing this? So um, this just came up as one of the challenges um, in our group. So um, everything we do, I'll, I'll just um, come out and be honest, you know, we're very informal in our group. So, but this is one of the things that um, came out as our one of our top three challenges um, for our statewide leaders is the educating the educators and so um, I think Amy even mentioned this in the chat earlier is about um, doing that um, train the trainer um, information and having the people that we you know having that educational support for those educators who we have going out and trying to deliver these messages and advocate for um, for this movement so Great. And, um, you know, I would just turn this over to Quill to say, I, I think we are educating educators. We aren't using that terminology um, in Arlo, but I, I would think that your project on professionalism speaks to that. Yeah, I think so. And I think, um, again, our project is really about facilitating access to the tools that are there. Um, and trying to figure out what's there and what doesn't exist yet and and build connections between and highlight the good things that are happening that are there for everybody. Okay. So I think that's really important to us. Wonderful. So um, I just in the matter of time, because we do want to go through this in the next 10 minutes, um, I think what I'm going to do um, and um, Amy, let me know if you have any suggestions because Amy, this was Amy's wonderful idea was the crosswalk. Um, maybe we'll go through um, each row and then if there's something specific that one of our uh, uh, groups wants to say, um, we'll open that up to them and then um, to others who might want, who have a question or something. So I'm gonna, does that work, Amy? What do you think? Does that work for the crosswalk? Yeah, I mean, uh like Spencer this morning, um, or at the beginning of this meeting, I'm just someone who does better if I have something concrete to look at. And so, um, you know, that's really the purpose of this document as I understand it. Right. I yeah. think it might be more productive of a conversation if we can say, rather than what each group is doing, try to find overlap space so, for example, in the conversation that we were just having about educating educators, I'm going to make a point of connecting with Rebel and saying, you know, what will serve the folks um, who are raising that need and how can our current existing matrix support you in that work? Does that make sense? So, because the point of the crosswalk is to figure out if we're re doing each other's work or if our work right. can support one another. So I think that might be where we should be having this conversation. I, I would add to, um, I think it's, I think in addition to what Quill is saying, like to what extent do these need to be done 
separately. Like one of the things that came up in the last state leaders phone call that Rebel organized was like, um, you know, hey, let's put documentation of X, Y, and Z in these folders so that we can find each other's documentation of work more easily. And then it's like, well, okay, is is that the best place to put things? And I think that's where like um, Denise and James have done such good work thinking about um, where we might want to um, have things so that they are located in a really findable place um, where they will be stewarded well. And so, um, you know, like if we want to know about each other's grant programs, for example, um, I think that was the the one that sort of made me sit up and wonder like, okay, so should I put the documentation of Oregon's grant program? Should I publish a blog post on openoregon.org and then always just point people to that link? Uh -huh. Should I put things into the Google Drive folder um, that the um, state leaders group is using? I know the Open Textbook Network has a lot of interest in sharing information about grant programs and so on. Um, so these are some of the places where I get stumped personally. Yeah, really good point that there's multiple places to go to. Um, so Quill, I'm sorry, could you, <laughs> they just speak that I've been online too long today. Can you explain to me what your strategy was? It seems like the way to go, but I, I'm not sure I understood it. Or you could lead it if you would like. <laughs> well, I'll take one on. <laughs> How's that? Okay. Um, so um, let's see, I'm going to go down the line. So we're looking at state policy and examples of implementation. And we kind of heard already um, what Arlo is doing. But I want to like turn to the higher ed compacts and the state leaders to have a conversation right now. Like how does the work we're talking about doing fit with work you're already doing and or what, how do they complement each other? Perfect. Um, so Tanya, do you, would you like to start? So can you tell me the question again, what the work that you're currently doing, which particular work? So the work that Denise was just describing around um, collecting a pilot project of some state documents um, and maybe narratives to support that work. Um, can that, how does that complement what the higher ed compacts are doing right now? Um, and does it, you know, are we redo, are we duplicating work? Are we supporting work? What is that? Is there a place where these support each other? I think this is, so it's very supportive. Um, so let's say the regional compact held a meeting with um, their states and people wanted to know history and implementation of a certain policy in a state. And if you'd produce that document, we'd be able to promote it and invite you to speak at the meeting and share more broadly with the stakeholders in the room. So in some ways, what it would do is give your work a platform or a place to go, right? So how, how would people access the thing that you're creating? Well, we could, we could easily get that out to states super quickly. Um, in a concerted way that would organize thoughts about it and conversations and all the things and kind of give you a space to talk about it. Um, there's no conflict in it. it in waves, um, it would just only help. And that's one of the things that I've talked about doing in the past was uh, more of a qualitative inquiry with the leaders. Like, what are the qualities of a state leader in OER? What are the qualities of what are the um, pieces of a state initiative that that have to be there for it to be successful those kinds of questions so I think I mean it's it's great great and um, so Rebel did you want to talk a little bit about what you guys are collecting so um, I can just say like I'm on Denise's group so I fully support what Denise is doing in that area and I totally get what Tanya is saying about you know bringing the highlight of the platform 
that the regional area can do. Um, I think some of what we're having shared in our documents are still um, what people may consider working documents or ongoing documentation and things like that. So I think um, it may also be, be like a building place where we could build up um, uh, maybe a topic area in different areas in a, in a background way. Um, some of these things are shared and some of the things that we share in the conversations, we don't record our meetings so that people can be open. And I think that's kind of like the idea of the, the back end share as well is that um, we're freely sharing to our state leaders, but we may not want this um, out there um, maybe on blast for everyone in the world to see, so. Perfect, perfect, thanks for that. Um, and then sustainability, um, it, uh, you're also addressing that one, Rebel, right? Yeah, that was an area that came up kind of in both areas of our top two areas um, for funding and for um, getting administrative backing. And as we started to talk more about those two topic areas, um, we really <clears throat> kind of drilled in that sustainability and what are those sustainability efforts that um, help support both of those um, different things? Okay, excellent. Um, and and uh, I would just say from, to, can I just quick jump in with sus sustainability and compacts real quick? Um, the reason why this is so supportive is that the compacts are so long standing historically and they're not going anywhere. And so this, in many ways, all the things that we've talked about with open, like we need to make it part of the fabric and we need to have it be baked into every education conversation. That's where the compacts do those kinds of large, um, they set the, they kind of set the standard or the, the conversation. So if OER is part of that, it's part of the fabric of how states do state policy. Really good point, really good point. Um, and the stewardship of content and data, I'm sorry, content and student data. Student data. Um, once again, I think, uh, Rebel, you're doing um, complementary work. Yeah, so again, um, mainly our focus is on how does that support the um, funding and the administrative backing and very much looking at um, ways to create a potential um, nationwide template so that um, we're all reporting up the same information. And, and Rebel, this is James, uh, nationwide template for what? I'm not, I didn't follow. For the different data points that we're trying to come up with um, for data and assessment point, basically the idea is to um, work with um, data research experts who have already been doing um, research on OER and look at what are the different areas that they are identifying and then potentially um, come together as group as leaders and say okay well which of these can we say we should you know we should all be reporting on this. Excellent and so the, the data points around let's say impact and efficacy. Right. Terrific thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think it's you know, super complementary to uh, the vision of our stewardship group, but not not overlapping necessarily. So that, I think that's good. Thanks, James. And Deep, I would say that there's some connection here with um, your um, data standards for OER research, which has now been renamed, correct? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, it's a research agenda. Yeah, so I think there's there may be a, some overlap here. Would you say? Yeah, yeah, um, I think there's definitely good opportunity for conversation. Okay. All right, excellent. All right, and then of course we've got Quill's uh, professionalism, the matrix uh, of roles and professional development. Um, And uh, I, once again, I know that Rebel um, is focusing on state level roles, uh, given where they're at. And uh, so Thanks. that could be an additional piece of the, of the matrix, if it made sense. 
sorry, go ahead, Quill. It could be. I think I want to just also add here that part of the reason to do the crosswalk and have this conversation is to figure out um, what is the sustainability of our low work look like in terms of, you know, we're midway through our project now. We um, are trying to figure out what is the best way to move forward in terms of stewardship of these projects like does it keep living with arlo and ccc oer does it or oec does it go um oe global excuse me or does it go elsewhere i i think so when i'm looking at professionalism um and the matrix i definitely will have a conversation with rebel and and figure out like how is this serving a wider need um but I guess I'm asking the group as well. Do you see duplicates of this work happening in other spaces where we could be building on sustainability by connecting to other groups? Well, around sustainability or, or professionalism? I think I'm talking about sustainability as okay. in sustainability of the overall project, not just sustainability of yeah. my project. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so Cheryl recommends connecting with the Open Textbook Network and that's a good place to start. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that, Cheryl. Now we're um, moving to the um, projects that uh, doers um, are, are running, leading. Um, and I don't know, Deep, do you want to uh, share this? Or we, it looks like um, with regards to the OER uh, vendor landscape, you've got uh, cooperation, collaboration with uh, three of the groups. Yeah, and I would certainly also, I don't know exactly, I'd love to hear from Tanya and Rebel too about their, um, the projects listed there. I would say for the one from our side, it's, a pretty short paper it's mostly done um i so i don't even know if it's the same thing as as the others um i think what we're trying to do is um just paint the market in a way that actually compares it with some commercial options um tanya or rebel could you guys say more about what you guys are doing there so for us, I think our main purpose is to try to share stories and vendor um, platforms that the different statewide systems have already used and what are their experiences with those. Yeah, we're, we're definitely not getting into that. So are you talking about the vendor landscape analysis? Yeah, the one, the road that Una's on there on the thing. So, hey. um, one of the one of the really strong points about MEC, the Midwestern Higher Education Compact, is that they create something called contracts of convenience. They do this nice. with all kinds of vendors, um, and what they are able to do is, on behalf of the states, they create sort of a a template um, that a vendor would agree to, right? So, in terms of uh, privacy for students, in terms of pricing, all of these. Um, negotiation points that individual states would have to do on their own, they can look to MEC to crowdsource it. And it saves a lot of money and it saves a lot of time for them. Um, and then MEC makes those available to all of the compacts and all of their compact states. So it's kind of a, a national service that they do and part of the agreement. Um, they haven't started doing this yet. So I'm not calling this a project. It is a consideration. Mm -hmm. But there's a possibility that if MEC were to do something like, let's say, um, student course marking, at this point, every institution has to go and negotiate with their course marking yeah. vendor to install some kind of a plugin to create, and that costs a lot of money and it's a lot of time. If MEC could create a contract of convenience that lays out all of the parameters, then everyone would have that same ability to do implement you know these course markings into their student management system um, it is such an advantage to have like a one point of contact to them um, that's what that's just an example of something that we could do 
with the vendor landscape that they're exploring, but I wouldn't call it a project per se. They are, these are things that they do routinely and have offered as an option possibly for the OER community. That's really helpful. Yeah, I'm not hearing much overlap there. I, I think certainly on those two, there's no way Doers is planning to go into the level of depth either that you're talking about or Rebel, the level what you're talking about of commenting on individual vendors. Excellent. Um, how about if we go to the next one then, the data standards, or if you, do you want me to rename that? Um, no, I mean, I, I, um, yeah, but at least from the doer's perspective, this is sort of setting up a, a research agenda and trying to collect data. Um, I'd love to hear what other folks are doing on that, whether it's standards or, or data collection or, um, uh, Tanya, could you say a bit more about the compacts? In terms of data standards for OER research, a lot of what they're interested in is cost savings data um, points. And so like at legislators particularly, and especially now with COVID um, and state budgets, everybody's interested in how much is this gonna cost and how much will this save? And that's really what moves a legislator or a big policymaker to sign off on something like we we love the other aspects of OER we're all about like teaching and learning and openness and sharing and all of that a, a straight up policymaker in a suit wants to say what what's the bottom line and what's my return on investment and so we we're interested in providing um, a more unified way of calculating that in states that's super. I, the doers one is focused um, really on the learning outcomes um, and is not dealing with cost. So it's about um, the last I saw from the work group was, you know, identifying what sort of teaching practices that people do with OER that we're really seeing make a difference in student outcomes. So it's, uh, there's not, I'm really glad to hear about that project and getting more systematic uh, cost data that, that's not really in our focus for this one. Uh, Rebel, what about you? What, what, um, what were you all thinking in terms of um, the data standards piece? So I think we um, covered this earlier, but that would be for the, the nationwide templates. So what it feeds into the st student data would also feed into that. So we would be looking at um, what are the points or what are the you know, standards that we should be looking at for each of these different assessment areas. Okay, that, that could be one that we talk about. Maybe we should talk about that offline a bit and uh, see if there's any opportunities there. Sounds great. All right, our, our next one is the equity guidebook that uh, Doers is working on. Um, I don't know. Want to give an opportunity to um, Tanya or um, Rebel to speak to what they're doing in that. Why space. not? I don't know why I put a yes there. We care about equity and we're doing work with equity and baking, but we're not making a guidebook. So you can say no if if you want to on the guidebook part, but definitely emphasis on equity. Okay. Yeah, I would say um, we're not developing a guidebook um, there, but more looking at the analysis and the, and the rubric, um, developing a rubric or um, some national data points for that. We should definitely talk about that then, because that's definitely, there's definitely parallel work. Great, great. All right, and uh, Deep, your next one is the bookstore fulfillment. Yeah. Um, I, well, I think I explained that um, earlier. We we did a survey and we're putting together sort of best practices, I think, from the chain from um, all the way thinking about when we create OER, do you have an ISBN? Um, what are uh, institutions and faculty doing in terms of policy and getting information to the bookstore, accurate information, um, the software element at the bookstore, and then actually what's happening in the sorry, the software element between them and the bookstore and, and there. So we're pretty close on that one too. Um, I don't want to make a promise I can't keep, but we're, we have 95% of a draft. Um, 
uh, on there. Um, so that's kind of the direction we're going. We're making recommendations around practices. Um, what about other folks on, on this line, uh, Rebel? So for ours, we're mainly, again, uh, doing kind of like with the vendors, we're collecting stories um, and resources that people are using um, with, uh, with reaching out to the bookstore and um, ways that they may have uh, their, their listings set up or um, how, they're, how they're doing that workflow process. So sharing of information mainly. Great. Um, Amy, is this at all related to any of the uh, work that your sustainability group has been collecting? Regarding bookstores? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I couldn't remember if there's policies or... Um, oh, if, thank if, you. Yeah. I closed that window, but yes, you're right. I, yeah, there was some stuff about things like course marking and no cost and low cost labeling, which often also shows up in bookstore software. And there was some research in Oregon um, about, you know, students want to see consistent, you know, logos or information across all the places like the schedule where they register and the bookstore where they buy the books. They want that same kind of marking information to be consistently displayed. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, and I think uh, your last one there, um, Deep, is the tenure and promotion. Yeah. Um, and I definitely see the connection to the professionalism side. Um, uh, Tanya from the Compacts, um, could you say a bit more about what sort of work is going on? For OER tenure and promotion? Yeah. The only thing that would be there is just looking at policy, talking about policy, but not particularly like, it's all just from a policy perspective. Yeah, um, I'd say with, with the doer side, we're still trying to, with, well, like I said, we initially scoped it as policy and have decided to move away from that piece. And I think more of um, kind of giving, um, culture change advice to, you know, system administrators for them to flow it down. Um, the other piece that we're talking about um, to that, and I'm wondering if this is something that could overlap with the professionalism a bit, and there's some collaboration there, is guidance to faculty. Um, so if you're writing up your, um, I forget what it's called, dossier, um, uh, you know, for promotion, how do you um, talk about it? Um, actually, I was also going to ask, um, Andy, are you still on? I am, yeah. Okay, um, anything to add about um, how we're thinking about it? I think it was, we definitely wanted um, faculty guidance as a piece, you know, so if you're writing up OER, um, but, but what Andy and I and, and the work group have been working on is really developing a kind of a mapping between different OER contributions and different um, categories that people look at in tenure and promotion. You, do you want to say a little bit, Andy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we pivoted away from the policy thing because if you really like look at, you know, any like a cross section, either at like you know at an R one and a, a regional comprehensive and a community college and uh, and their individual tenure and promotion policies, and then at certain schools, you know, tenure and promotion policies and and not necessarily policies but guidelines vary from department to department so the idea of setting together like some kind of master you know policy intervention just seemed not tenable so i think we pivoted more like deep is saying towards more of an advisory thing for you know culture change strategies and then for faculty just sort of setting together like a, a kind of like matrix of of you know if we take you know our research teaching and service like categories for tenure promotion and then a set of, um, you know, possible sort of contribute types of contributions via OER, whether that be, you know, increased student success via open pedagogy or, you know, uh, using an open text textbook or editing an open text textbook or creating more OER, right? So just to sort of be able to pinpoint where all those will fit and make and sort of give some sample arguments of why they would fit there. So 
um, you know, the folks at Doers seem to think it's working. It's like a, it's a good idea. So I think we're, you know, going to keep moving with that. Yeah, and in fact, the thing Rebel just added in the chat, that is, Andy, Andy's been on family leave. Congratulate him on, on a new arrival to the family. Um, uh, but Andy, one thing we talked about when you were out was um, whether we could find some case studies of like, you know, people right. who have been successful with OER in their career. Um, that's just some feedback I got from other folks that maybe we could add that. So Rebel, I think that's along the lines you're talking about that. Um, yeah. I think we think and, for the faculty piece in particular, um, I mean, it would be awesome if we could find like a departmental example of, you know, how they really embraced OER in their promotion policy. We're not so, you know, I think we'd have to dig around, but I think that we certainly, you know, there are individuals who have done very well with it. So we could, you know, try to profile, what did you do? How did you talk about it? All that kind of, all those details. And that's certainly a place I think where we could uh, collaborate with folks to just to find folks or, or to work on the content together. Um, Absolutely. How, how much does that o overlap the with the professionalism ag agenda, which I know obviously covers a lot more based on the presentation before. Is there anything there where we should be talking about that jointly? Oh, th this is Suzanne, um, and I'm not sure this is exactly what you're saying, but as you're talking, what I'm starting to realize that might be helpful is some way of validating various um, professional activities so that when they are put on um, on a resume or whatever, it it shows. Uh, I, I was earlier on a um, accreditation meeting, so this is making me think a lot of accreditation. It'd be really awesome if there was a way to have um, maybe OE Global or something have a, a stamp of approval for different um, professional development opportunities so that when I put it on a resume, it has that sort of weight. Just tossing that out there as a thought. Yeah. That is a helpful thing, Suzanne. Yeah. And I, I think we would love to talk more about that in the professionalism group. Um, and part of this work has been trying to figure out where does credentialing like that live? Um, what is the organization within our, because as a librarian, you know, anything I do that comes with ACRL training on it immediately means something to any institution I apply for. Um, it does not, like, OE Global may not speak to people who've never heard of the organization before. Does that make sense? Like, we don't have a central professional field um, organization as, as, and that's one of the things I think we need to address and, and discuss. Excellent. Super. And I'm just going to put my email in the in the chat. If folks have other, thank you for that suggestion of someone to profile. Um, send them to me and Andy, and we can, um, you know, maybe learn something from those folks that we could, you know. Again, I think to Tanya's point earlier, just it's so different in so many places. It's really hard to recommend a general approach, but some case examples of what people have tried and how it worked um, uh, for them, you know, at least that's illustrative even if it's very hard to give general general advice about this topic. Great, thank you. Thank you for that, Deep, and everyone else. We just have a couple of more, uh, and I would wanna go through those because those are specific to Florida. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left, guys, and I thank the East Coast people for hanging in there. I know it's late. Um, so um, Rebel, you have funding sustainability trends and current events, and um, you shared with us the folder where you're keeping all of that. Um, do you want to briefly tell people what's what's up there? So uh, funding was our number one top challenge reported by the group. I think there were so many pluses on that one that um, I, I couldn't count them all. So uh, funding was definitely um, something that our group is working on, and we're just um, every meeting working on talking about solutions of what are some solutions that we can do um, to meet our funding needs and um, obviously sustainability um, is a big piece of that if we can get funding or find some permanent funding or a way to permanently fund um, our efforts then it becomes more sustainable. Excellent, excellent and I, I see Tanya also um, agrees that that's a focus for them. At the complex. The last um, three are Tanya's. Um, and so, Tanya, would you like to address those and then ask for um, uh, feedback to lines 14, 15, and 16? Sure. Um, the, I guess the thing that I've 
you know, throughout this conversation that is coming to light is that we're, we don't really have um, projects necessarily or um, short-term goals. The capacity of the compact is very, very long-term and more, um, I guess, just in this whole idea of building connections and capacity within states and across states would be a very long-term goal and something that would take time. Um, and also within research, that might be empowering researchers who are already doing some of this work. And I, I mentioned Virginia Clinton, who's a friend of mine at UND, um, and started with me back in North Dakota when I was here. But now she's part of the Open Education Research Group with um, John Hilton and doing amazing work with research. But we could support um, ongoing research in student efficacy and, and implementation. Um, the last one, uh, 16, is particularly focused on the talents of the Southern Regional Education Board. They have K-12 and higher ed as part of their focus. They do a lot of work already with K-12 dual credit and career and technical education for OER. Um, SREB is magnificent in the K-12 space, and so we would um, utilize their their already their expertise and then scale that across the compact and share that with others so um, in some ways what you're seeing here is that each of the compact regions have like specialties where mech is really great at contracting um sreb is spectacular at k-12 dual credit career and tech ed and then we would be able to share out those results with the community and then across states so that we're not each doing it separately, we're doing it all together and sharing the information. Yeah, thanks for that, Tanya. And, you know, specifically with CCCOER, which is of course separate um, from Arlo, uh, there's, a, there's quite a connection with um, dual credit at the high school level. And of course, OEG has just added um, membership to K through 12 institutions. So um, definitely a lot of interest uh, in that area. So look forward to working with you more on that. Um, I did want to give the last few minutes, uh, but if anyone has any questions or, or, or has any comments to make, I wanted to give the last few minutes to um, Quill and Amy, who were going to hold uh, just a little bit of a community discussion. Does that work for everyone? So let me see, I have to, <laughs> I'm getting confused, it's the end of the day. Um, let's so um, I think we've kind of had some of this discussion with the crosswalk, but I don't wanna hold people too much longer. So I think what I wanna do is just raise the question of um, how, do, how does this work that we've been doing with Arlo um, and that we will continue for our, with our low until I think October is our one year mark, right? So what should next steps look like? How do we make this work meaningful in the lives of people who, who we're trying to serve? Um, and that would be all of you. And I know all of you have contributed to this work as well. So I guess I'm asking, what do you want our next steps to be? Hey, Quill, this is deep. Are you, are you talking about beyond October or just in, in the am, shorter term? I'm talking, I maybe a little bit of both, but I'm really thinking about beyond October. So one of the th questions that keeps coming up for the Arlo kind of work group leaders is where does our work live when it's completed? Um, if, if we finish the sustainability matrix and the professionalism matrix, um, where does that work live? Yeah. How how is it? Question. Where's what's the community surrounding it? You know, if we're talking about the commons, how does the commons take care of it? <laughs> um, and you know, is it another one of those projects that we think is really really valuable but don't have the sustainability built into the beginning and end of it? Um, 
and some of the other projects kind of have found partnerships already, but I think we're still asking that question. What is, where does it live beyond the time that we say, okay, moving it on. <laughs> And, you know, I, I appreciate you raising it because we kind of have the same questions with doers, you know, which is, it's a volunteer group, right? You know, who is it there five years from now, three years from now? I don't know. You know, it's, it's uh, so I've had the same question. Um, I see Rebel's comment about OER repository. That's a good question. Um, one thing that we're going to try with Equity uh, Guidebook, we just talked to, or Blueprint, we just talked to Michelle Reed today for that particular one, because we see it evolving a lot, we thought maybe in press books. I know you're not just talking about the technology, but also that, but I just wanted to get, um, that's something we're considering about that, just publishing at least one of them as kind of an OER, more in the book format. But the rest of them, I think, wouldn't work that way for us. I like that concept of what are the things that can live and kind of be um, a slow revision iteration kind of process and I think that that you know when you're talking about a guidebook that makes total sense um, and I think that might even the sustainability work maybe might fit in with something that's a little I, Amy, what do you think I would love to see case studies of people using them in the next year or more, um, particularly around that sustainability tool to assess and then address issues at their own institutions or at their own statewide level. I think that that's such a good idea. And I think also that there's a discussion to be had before thinking down that path because um, like to Deep's point, like, um, you know, if we decide, um, just to take the example of Arlo, if we decide Arlo was a one-year project, then it really needs to, the baton needs to be passed to, um, you know, another steward to do that um, case study and see, you know, what is the subsequent history of these projects. Um, the other thing that the crosswalk, I think, is really suggestive of it, to me is the question like, um, you know, we, we had these three really grassroots um, initiatives spring up to meet similar needs. Um, you know, in particular, the group that Rebels coordinating is just like, statewide leaders want to find each other. Like, how do we make it easier to connect? Um, and I think that Arlo and Dewar's, um, really at their hearts have um, meet a similar need of like, we want to find our colleagues. And then the natural next thing to do is to be like, well, is there a problem that we can solve together now that we've um, met? But, you know, it, do we, do we want to continue on separate paths? Like to what extent do we want to think about, you know, combining forces? Um, what is going to feel sustainable using that word with all due caution, you know. And, and, and Amy, if I could add, if I could add something to Amy's question too, is, um, you know, I think when we look at the project list and we think, you know, is there duplication? Obviously, if people are inventing the same thing, it doesn't make sense to invent two of them. Um, but are there other ways to collaborate across those rows also? So for example, if one group develops something, um, like I would, you know, like, uh, in Denise's case, the survey, could we use doers to disseminate it? So it could also be that um, in addition to, I, I love Amy's question, which is big picture, what should we do with all these? And it's a great question. Um, and then I think the other thing is, um, even if people you know, aren't on one line with other people, can they, through all of our membership lists, get some more stuff out there, You know, calls for information or just disseminate things so they have impact? This is Brittany. Um, I have to hop off here, but I think that at least that crosswalk for me really demonstrated how much overlap or how much potential overlap there might be. Um, and 
I think that this conversation is a really good and needed conversation, um, particularly because of, of that. And, and maybe not everyone feels that that way. Maybe that's just my own. Um, but I do think that we could have this conversation as its own conversation. Um, you know, not at the end of our, our three hours when we're um, we're all exhausted and you know done with Zoom, um, but maybe maybe a separate meeting where we can you know this can be the focus and we can come at it with fresh eyes and and really make some decisions that are best for the community. And this is James. I, I would just want to echo Brittany's comment and encouragement that we devote more time to this. This is also for me really helpful, and I'll I'll take us back to the the comments that I opened with, uh, uh, encouraging us to control our destiny and to uh, view ourselves as part of a continuum uh, in, in the movement becoming a field. Uh, and I, I don't have real concrete ideas about what that looks like, but I think it's happening all around us. So, and, and the crosswalk is one indication of that very positive, in a very positive way that we're moving in the same direction from different sectors of education, different experiences, different, uh, different roles. Uh, we're, we're all kind of heading in the same direction and see similar problems to tackle. So. Second, second, Brittany's uh, suggestion. Wonderful. Then there's more ideas coming out in the chat window. I think we're probably at the end here. Uh, please feel free to contribute in the chat. I, I we're at, um, are we at five after. We're at three after. Um, once again, um, there is the survey. It's Bitly June nine survey uh, with the J and the S capitalized. Um, I love the idea of another meeting. Um, perhaps the four groups uh, should talk about um, uh, how we might want to do that uh, to continue this conversation. Um, so we'll be in touch about that. And thanks everyone for all those, all your feedback and the great ideas today. Yes, and thank you so much to Liz for <laughs> doing all this in the background. And uh, thank you all for coming. And of course, to our panelists and presenters. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Thank everyone. You, it was nice to see you.